The National Desk, America's News Now. Devastating damage. All of a sudden, just heard the wind start to pick up, house start to shake, and all of a sudden, I just felt the entire house move. Severe weather leaving a path of destruction as millions of Americans brace for more storms today. Sounding the alarm. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. Records do, in fact, exist. I know this because I've personally passed them to the FBI. Whistleblowers go on the record and testify that Boeing knew about safety issues with commercial planes. Hanging by a thread. I'm operating with the smallest margin in U.S. history. I have a one vote margin. The only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. In an election year, having a speaker who can't do the job is really bad. The House leadership in jeopardy as Republicans fight over sending taxpayer dollars to foreign countries. And footing the bill. It's a big middle finger uh, to working class folks who either paid off their student loans or didn't take them out in the first place. How much you could end up paying for someone else's student loan debt. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It is Thursday, April 18th, and more states right now bracing for severe weather with a major plunge in temperatures set to sweep in. It also comes days uh, after those brutal storms, including winds so strong they literally tore the home right off its foundation here in Ohio. Check this out. This is incredible video right here. We want to get right to Angela Brown at the live desk for the latest forecasts and damage. My goodness. Yeah, and that damage is really adding up. We have a live look at the National Desk Radar where these severe thunderstorms warnings are in pink. You can see them right here behind me. They're set to expire in the next few minutes over parts of Kansas and also Missouri. Now the lower Ohio Valley is bracing for another round of storms today. We're going to have a look ahead at today's threats in just a minute. But first, we have some brand new video for you just into the live desk out of Ber Berman, Ohio, about 40 miles southeast of Columbus, where the night sky, you can see it here. Those are flashes of lightning you're looking at really lighting up the night sky. And utility workers made major progress overnight as well, restoring power to thousands at one point though more than 32,000 were in the dark in Pennsylvania overnight. Thankfully that's now down to just over 10,000 at last check and take a look at this video right here. You're looking at it out of Ohio. That is inside right here of a family dollar store. You can see in some cases right over there the items just tossed around on the floor. Now to a live look over St. Louis, Missouri as another round of severe thunderstorms, you know, is threatening that region today as well, bringing strong wind, large hail and maybe even tornadoes. Now here's a look at the region that will likely see storm threats this afternoon, spanning from the lower Ohio Valley all the way south to Del Rio. And now to a live look over Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the cities that starting today here will start to feel temperatures drop by Saturday. Nearly 200 million Americans will feel below average temperatures. The most noticeable changes are expected to be in the high plains where the highest temperatures could reach uh, 15 to 20 degrees below average. Now we are keeping an eye as always on all of this all morning live right here on the live desk and online at the National Weather Desk, part of the nationaldesk.com. Thank you, Angela. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country would not bow to outside pressure to hold off on a response to Iran's attack. While it's still unclear how Israel will respond, U.S. officials have said they do expect any military action to be limited in scope. Israeli defense leaders right now only say their response would be decided by them at a time of their choosing. And the U.S. now expected to try to block a United Nations vote tomorrow. That would give Palestine full U.N. membership, effectively recognizing a Palestinian state. If it passes a Security Council vote today, the U.S. could move to veto the resolution. And the battle in the House heating up over foreign aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene threatening right now to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson if he sides with Democrats. Last night, Johnson did add a border security bill. It's not going to be part of the final aid package, though, causing some Republican colleagues to question his leadership and priorities. Johnson, though, now poised 
to possibly lean on Democrats to pass some of the bills. For the first time in history, the Senate has exonerated a public official who refused to resign without holding a trial or reviewing evidence. Republicans slamming Democrats for rejecting the impeachment charges against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Yesterday, Senate Democrats did vote to dismiss the articles that the House delivered. In the 237 years of our nation's history, I don't know that there has been a more shameful day in the United States Senate than today. What we just witnessed was a travesty. It was a travesty to the United States Constitution, and it was a travesty to the American people. The article said Mayorkas willfully and systematically ignored U.S. immigration laws. He's now set to testify before the Senate about his budget requests later today. We're now learning a foreign national charged in a double murder used President Biden's CBP-1 app to enter the U.S. Fox News reporting Haitian migrant Canole Baptiste got into the U.S. by making an appointment on the CBP-1 app last summer. New York authorities say two weeks ago he stabbed and killed his two roommates who are also from Haiti. And we now know the suspect charged in the death of a Democratic staffer entered the U.S. illegally. Nevada authorities charged Honduran national Elmo Ride Linares with hit and run charges after a crash earlier this month that killed Kurt Engelhart. Engelhart was a senior advisor to Nevada Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Rueda Linares is in jail, and ICE has placed a detainer on him so that they can start those deportation proceedings. And now we're learning of the skyrocketing number of Chinese nationals illegally entering the U.S. between ports of entry. Customs and Border Protection report that from October to March, agents did catch 24,296 Chinese nationals. That's already more than the 24,124 caught in all of the prior fiscal year and does not include the numbers at ports of entry. And breaking this morning, law enforcement across several states are working to restore services after widespread outages overnight that block calls to police and other emergency agencies. Now, this morning, some services are still spotty in South Dakota. The State Department of Public Safety says if you cannot call 911, you can text them or call their non-emergency line. The city of Del Rio in Texas also reporting issues, although police there say it was a problem with the phone carrier and not the city system in that case. And all four states are really reported feeling these impacts. We already told you about South Dakota. We already told you about Texas. Now let's talk about portions of Nebraska and also Nevada, including Las Vegas in this case. We're talking, we're taking a live look right now. It's still dark, as you can see there on the strip this morning. Las Vegas police reported issues there were resolved just before 9.15 last night, several hours after the outages even started. So far, no hurt though on what caused all of this. Again, service is still down in several states this morning. We are watching for any new details. If we learn anything, we're going to share it with you right here at the Live Desk and, of course, online at thenationaldesk.com. Angela, thanks so much. New developments in President Biden's classified documents case. Some lawmakers now warning of national security concerns after analyzing the classified records he had in his personal possession. Florida Congressman Mike Waltz wrote, I just reviewed a portion of Biden's classified documents that were taken from his basement by special counsel Her, They were highly classified and relevant to current national security threats. We need an immediate damage assessment from the intelligence community. A testimony on Capitol Hill accusing Army officials of lying about their response to the Capitol riot. Four National Guard whistleblowers testified before a House oversight panel slamming a Defense Department report that claims leadership acted appropriately. The whistleblowers testified they were in place and ready to help on January 6th, but military leadership failed to authorize them to help in a timely manner, and that leadership, they say, then lied about their failure to act. We had a force equipped and ready to respond, and despite the inaccuracies of the DODIG report, we had a plan and would have liked the opportunity to try. Only at 5.09 p.m. in the early evening, which I wrote down in my wheel book, was the D.C. Guard given order to deploy and move to the Capitol to assist Capitol Police. We arrived too late. The D.C. National Guard was ready to help and assist Capitol Police, but we were not allowed to do our job due to paralyzed decision-making by Acting Secretary of Defense Chris Miller and Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy. The whistleblowers testified these decisions delayed the National Guard response by three hours, 19 minutes. Former President Trump and several of his administration officials have consistently maintained that they had called up the National Guard days before January 6th 
to help with crowd control or any emergencies. More than a dozen U.S. attorneys general are accusing Bank of America of targeting customers for their religious and political beliefs. The 15 AGs signed a letter criticizing the bank for a pattern of discriminatory behavior. The letter claims conservative clients were either denied accounts, had their accounts closed, or were denied basic services like ATM use. The House approved a bill that would limit how the government can purchase your online data. It is called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act, and it now requires law enforcement or other government agencies to first get a warrant before buying information from third-party companies that collect your information from apps. Amazon ditching its cashierless checkout system at its grocery stores, but now trying to sell that same checkout technology to other businesses. The National Desk's Janae Bowens joins us more. Uh, with more on this. And, and Janae, I got to tell you, some of these, what, Amazon Fresh stores, a lot of people might not know what they are. I know I was just talking to Angela. She's never been to one. I've been to one one time. Do you shop here? I don't shop there regularly, but we do have one here in this area. Um, but when it comes to this getting rid of their cashierless systems, it seems like it's a situation of one man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, Amazon says they are removing just walkout technology in their Amazon Fresh grocery stores because customers want a shopping assistant to travel with them in big grocery stores. Now, company leaders think the technology is better suited for smaller stores because oftentimes customers want to get in and get out of those shops quickly. According to the Associated Press, Amazon wants to sell the technology to more than 120 third-party businesses by the end of the year. Now, this could be an uphill battle, seeing as they're trying to sell the very thing they are removing from their stores. Now here's a little bit more about how the technology actually works. Once payment, whatever the method, has been authorized, a virtual cart is created and the gates will open. Let's walk inside. Once in the store, the cameras above, coupled with shelf sensors, will detect items removed from shelves by a consumer and will add that item to their virtual cart. Now the company says no facial recognition is used, once the customer is done shopping, they will exit through the gate and will be automatically charged. Now, there has been a lot of social media posts claiming that the system was powered by people in India who manually added up items in carts as customers shopped. And Jan, Amazon confirms using human reviewers for the technology, but says customers are not being watched live by people in India. But according to the AP, Amazon is declining to share how many people review and label videos when there is a glitch in the system. The company also denied to comment on how many reviews have had to be conducted. It is so fancy, too, when you take a look. I'm sure it also speeds up the time there when you check it out. Thanks so much, Danae. Ahead this morning, fighting anti-Semitism. More college leaders taking the hot seat on Capitol Hill to explain how they are trying to stop the alarming campus trend. And then taking on the cost, how much the U.S. taxpayers could have to pay to cover President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. And right here at the live desk, breaking down the alarming accounts by a whistleblower revealing what they call dangerous oversights in the manufacturing process of Boeing planes. How lawmakers plan to act coming up in night.
flight fears mounting this morning after two back-to-back -back Senate hearings revealing what could be disastrous issues for some of Boeing's most popular planes. Right now, lawmakers are considering new legislation uh, to regulate Boeing, but getting anything passed really in Congress may be a long shot right now. Congress really isn't agreeing on anything. A whistleblower testified on Wednesday raising concerns about Boeing's manufacturing protocol claiming the company took shortcuts when it made the 777 and 787 Dreamline jets. He said crews assembling the plane failed to properly fill tiny gaps when joining together parts of the fuselage, something he says could be disastrous. Are these planes safe? Right now, I would not. You know, it's like an earthquake. You know, it, the big earthquake is coming, but when when that hits the building that you know you let's say if you're talking of a building have to be prepared to uh, accommodate that type of a let's say shake up you know it has to be built properly right now from what i've seen the airplanes are not being built per spec and per requirement well lawmakers are calling those accounts more than troubling, but Boeing is pushing back on these allegations, these accusations, saying they are inaccurate. For the past five years, the company also faced federal questioning about and scrutiny here following two deadly crashes of a different Boeing model. That's the 737 MAX we're talking about here. And adding to that pressure is what happened, of course, back in January when a door plug blew off midair during takeoff um, on an Alaska Airlines flight, making some people, of course, fearful right now of flying. Thank you so much, Angela. Republican lawmakers in California accused Democrats of watering down a bill that would make it a felony to buy or sell a child under 18 for sex. Democrats, though, would only advance the bill if criminals who attempt to buy sex with a 16 or 17 year old could still be charged with a misdemeanor. A new legal argument at the center of whether or not to release the writings by the Nashville school shooter could be released. Attorneys representing Covenant School parents argue the writings cannot be released under copyright law because the shooter's parents transferred ownership to Covenant parents. The National Police Association says it's important to release the writings of transgender former Covenant School student Audrey Hale to help prevent similar tragedies. And there is a, I think, a, a public expectation that those records will be released. And so now uh, that, that creates a new situation where uh, a lot of people are going to have a lot of problem with why are the records not being released. The court just wrapped up two days of hearings, but there's no timeline for the judge to make a decision and no guarantee that they're going to release the writings. A high school student now charged after attacking a teacher was caught on camera. The video going viral. It happened at Parkland High School in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Police arrested the student on Tuesday and charged him with three misdemeanors. The district will also hold a hearing at a later date to determine what to do about the student. New efforts to confront growing concerns about anti-Semitism on college campuses. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins reports from Capitol Hill. It was the president of Columbia University's turn to sit in the hot seat on Capitol Hill. Columbia strives to be a community free of discrimination and hate. Answering concerns regarding reports of rising anti-Semitism on campus following Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. The anti-Semitism on our campus makes me sick to my stomach. And we are taking steps to address it. Columbia, the center of several viral videos depicting alleged anti-Semitism. <laughs> Columbia's leadership team attempting to avoid the fate of Harvard and UPenn, whose presidents lost their positions following a similar hearing in December, where they were seen to sidestep a question about campus protesters chanting Intifada, which critics say is a direct call for the genocide of Jews. Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. Clearer answers were given Wednesday. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Columbia's code of conduct. Dr. Shafiq. Yes, it does. MIT's president sat for the same December hearing as Harvard and UPenn, but managed to keep her position. We spoke with MIT grad student Talia Khan. It's a much deeper problem than just getting rid of the president. And we've seen that at Harvard and Penn in the past few months. Even though the president's gone, 
uh, you know, the, the climate hasn't shifted so dramatically. Meanwhile, the University of Southern California canceling their valedictorian speech, citing safety concerns. The Muslim student says she's being silenced by anti-Palestinian hatred. Jewish students at USC say she supports the abolishment of Israel. The abolishment of the state of Israel, I'd like to clarify is the abolishment of an apartheid system. The Anti-Defamation League and the FBI reported historic levels of anti-Semitism since October 7th. The ADL says that spike shows no signs of slowing. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting. Diversity and equity staff jobs in North Carolina's public university system could be on the chopping block after the committee on university governance voted to reverse and replace existing DEI policy. Another vote is set for next month, and if approved, the repeal would take effect immediately. U.S. taxpayers now on the hook to cover another $7 billion in debt after President Biden plans to remove that responsibility for more than 270,000 student loan borrowers. National Desk's Matt Galka reports. Too many Americans, especially young people, are saddled with unsustainable debts in exchange for a college degree. President Joe Biden has tried to make canceling student loans a pillar of his time in office. The administration's latest announcement aims to cancel another $7.4 billion of debt, mostly through waiving high amounts of accrued interest. The Penn Wharton budget model has the new plan, along with other previous debt forgiveness plans, costing taxpayers big over the next decade. All told, taxpayers could be on the hook for $559 billion for the next 10 years. It's a big middle finger uh, to working class folks who either paid off their student loans or didn't take them out in the first place. Missouri Republican Senator Eric Schmidt sued the Biden administration over debt forgiveness in 2022 when he was his state's attorney general. The Supreme Court eventually stopped the president's last debt forgiveness effort. The White House says the new plan uses a different authority to get around the Supreme Court ruling. It's unconstitutional. He has no authority under statute to do it. It was struck down before. I think this is a cynical election year ploy. The $559 billion is equivalent to more than six years of the annual budget of the Department of Education. Even some Democrats admit canceling student loans doesn't get to the root cause of the high costs of education. I think the intent is good, uh, clearly, uh, to provide relief of student debt. I think it's how you go about it that I think for many is troubling and uh, needs more work. If the plan is finalized, the canceled accrued interest will take effect this fall, right around election time. But the plan will almost certainly be taken to court. Reporting in Washington, I'm Matt Galka. And breaking out of Las Vegas, a driver slammed into a group of people at a bus stop, killing two people, including a child. What we're learning from police this morning, coming up in 90 seconds. Live look this morning over Las Vegas after a deadly overnight crash when a wrong way driver plowed into a, a, a bus stop that killed 
Two people, including a child, three others are recovering in the hospital this morning. Now, here's a look at the scene of the crash. You can see uh, those police lights way back there in the distance and all of those police cars. Traffic is well backed up here. Police believe the driver could have been under the influence or speeding at the time of that crash. Now, we're working with our reporters on the ground in Las Vegas, uh, KSNV, to bring you any new details as they come in this morning right here at the Live Desk and, of course, online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Angela, thank you. Ahead in our next half hour, red threat lobbyists on behalf of China lining lawmakers' pockets as Washington considers a ban of CCP-controlled TikTok. Also, priced out, the American dream of owning a home slipping out of reach for many as high costs and interest rates keep buyers at bay. First, though, here's a look at America's news and weather now, where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. There are no big storms in the forecast in the Northeast, but we're tracking a few rounds of showers. First one this morning. Here we are 7 a.m. Uh, a line is running from northern New York all the way down through southern New England. This should peter out during the course of the afternoon, but notice there will be at least a chance for showers into and throughout the afternoon. Our next round is this feature right here that moves into the area on Friday. That's 2.30 in the afternoon. It should arrive in New England for Friday night and extending into very early Saturday. I'm meteorologist Jasmine Lomax with a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll start off with a few showers moving out of the area. It looks much better by the afternoon. However, another weather maker is going to lead to showers on Friday, and that's how we start the day. The rain will continue into the afternoon. High temperatures will reach the 40s through the 80s. Then overnight, we'll start to get cooler, dropping to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Good Thursday morning. I'm meteorologist Michael Ehrenberg with a look at your southeast regional forecast. We are looking at a mix of clouds and sunshine through parts of the southeast, but it will be mostly sunny from Virginia through south and North Carolina. Clouds, but little rain moving through parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. There will be some showers near the Mississippi River Valley at the Arkansas line and a line of storms probably heading into western sections of Tennessee and also uh, northern sections of Virginia late in the day. Highs 80s to near 90. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. We've got scattered rain and thunderstorms firing up across the central part of the Midwest today, and that'll race its way to the east. Now, behind that, it's going to be a lot cooler. Check out Bismarck, 41 for the high for the day today, 39 tomorrow. That rain shifts its way into the Ohio Valley overnight tonight into your Friday morning and racing out quickly, and that's going to leave all of us dry heading into the start of the weekend on Saturday. Definitely some cool temperatures, though, 50s and 40s all across the Midwest. Good Thursday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Hucci and look at our forecast across the region today and we'll be on the lookout for a few strong to perhaps a severe thunderstorm stretching from San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up into a uh, Little Rock and Shreveport, especially as we head through the evening hours. Could get a couple storms with some wind and some hail. We step in that our forecast Friday and outside some patchy clouds, a little bit of a calmer day with a few showers possible. And those temperatures will be running a little on the cooler side Friday afternoon. Good morning. I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Those very warm temperatures from Nevada into Arizona, getting into Phoenix in the mid 90s. Now up to the Pacific Northwest, we still have very cool temperatures in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon in the 50s. That goes into Montana, where we're staying so cool with still that cool low pressure, bringing in some mountain snow showers in the afternoon. That's the scene from here.
Now on the national desk, America's News Now, priced out. The American dream of buying and owning a home getting crushed by red hot inflation as new data shows renters are feeling stuck. Plus, no other way to describe it. It's surrender. It's disappointing. I'm oh, very disappointed. Only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. Funding fight. A vote set on where more than 95 billion taxpayer dollars could go, putting the House Speaker's position at risk. And the path of destruction. Communities in America's heartland that are already reporting major damage are preparing for yet another round of severe weather. Folks there just could not catch a break. And thanks for joining us this morning. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeff Coat. It is Thursday, April 18th, and weather alerts do remain in place for some already really hard hit areas. Angela Brown is at the live desk tracking the very latest for us this morning. Good morning to you, Angela. A live look at the National Desk Radar as thunderstorm watches and warnings are in effect in the pink and orange boxes. The lower Ohio Valley is bracing for another round of storms. A closer look ahead at today's threats in just a minute. First, though, we got some brand new video for you just into the live desk out of Bremen, Ohio, about 40 miles southeast of Columbus, where the night sky, you see all that lighting, really putting on a lightning show. And utility workers made major progress overnight, restoring power to thousands of folks. At one point, more than 32,000 were in the dark in Pennsylvania overnight. Thankfully here, though, that's now down to just 11,000 at last check this morning. And take a look at this video out of Ohio as well of major damage inside of a family dollar store. Uh, there were items, you can see it right here. Look at all those items just tossed across the floor on the ground. You can see them there, that store in simple disarray. Now to a live look over St. Louis, Major uh, Missouri, as another round of severe thunderstorms threatens that region today as well, bringing strong wind, large hail, and maybe even some tornadoes. Here's a look at the region that will likely see those storm threats this afternoon, spanning from the lower Ohio Valley all the way south to Del Rio. And now to a live look over Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, of one of the cities today starting uh, today that will start feel those temperatures drop by Saturday nearly 200 million Americans will feel below average temperatures in that region. The most noticeable changes are expected in the high plains where the highest temperatures could reach 15 to 20 degrees below average. Now of course we're keeping our eye on all of this all morning long right here at the live desk and online all the time at the National Weather Desk part of the National Desk.com. Thank you Angela. New developments in Israel's plans to respond to Iran's barrage of missiles strikes. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country will make its own decision on when and where to strike and Israel's finance minister said the response should be fierce and severe to deter future attacks. U.S. officials have said they expect any response involving military action would be limited in scope. Meantime this morning in Washington, House lawmakers sorting through a long list of proposed bills that do have the support of President Biden. House Speaker Mike Johnson officially set up a Saturday night vote on the foreign aid funding despite some backlash from his own party. I don't have all my Republicans who agree on that rule, and that means the only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. Altogether, the bills cost $95.3 billion and address aid for Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine. A key difference from the Senate's package is that $9.5 billion in economic aid to Ukraine would be structured as a loan, but the repayment terms would be set by President Biden. 80% of the money that would be allocated in this legislation is for replenishment of our own weapons and stocks. I mean, this is uh, something that makes sense. We're, we're, what we're doing is funding America's industrial defense base. These are jobs in America building weapons. My concern about this package is it's $95 billion of foreign aid when A, we're $34.5 trillion in debt, but B, we're also dealing with wide open borders. And, and central to our entire debate over the last year, as you know, has been the importance of making sure we secure the borders of the United States. In an attempt to get more Republicans on board, Speaker Johnson also introduced a renewed border security bill that could be voted on Saturday. It's the same as the House's H.R. 2 package that passed last year, but replaces funding for an e-verify requirement for employers with funding 
for border states to build walls and reimburse law enforcement agencies for border enforcement expenses. Both chambers are scheduled to be in recess next week, and it's not clear if the Senate's going to stay in Washington if the bills are passed. New this morning, China reportedly increasing its lobbying efforts on Capitol Hill as lawmakers consider a ban of TikTok. Right now, the Senate is considering a bill already approved by the House that would keep the platform out of U.S. app stores unless it cuts ties with its Chinese company controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Politico reports members of the Chinese embassy have been holding meetings with Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate. In a statement, the embassy said in part, TikTok has armed itself with dozens of lobbyists and spent millions of dollars to push back on the narrative around the company. The company has also spent millions on advertisements to rally su public support against the legislation and leveraged its consumer base via push alerts that allowed the app's users to easily call Congress. In a reversal, President Biden now taking a page out of former President Trump's playbook to get tougher on China. Yesterday, he called on his administration to consider tripling tariffs on Chinese steel while visiting the United Steelworkers headquarters in Pittsburgh. The Trump campaign blasted Biden's request, calling it too little too late. The people of Poland love him. They really do. They really love you. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish, but he's done a fantastic job and he's my friend. And we had uh, four great years together. Four great years. So let's do the man to do it again. Former President Trump meeting with more conservative foreign leaders while on the campaign trail. Last night, he did speak with Polish President Andrzej Duda at Trump Tower in New York City about the ongoing wars around the world. Trump's campaign also said they discussed the next steps in President Duda's proposal for NATO countries to spend 3% of their GDP on defense. New polling out this morning does have Trump leading Biden in five out of six battleground states. According to Echelon, Trump is up 51 to 45 percent in Arizona, Georgia 52 to 42, Michigan 51 to 45, Nevada 51 to 44, and Pennsylvania 49 to 45. Some Americans might want to move, but existing mortgages right now are too low to give up. The Federal Housing Finance Agency said homeowners are being paralyzed by current rates, and it's creating this lock in effect for the housing market across the country. The agency said the higher rates are responsible for about 1.3 million fewer home sales this spring compared to last. And nearly 40% of renters think they will never own a home now. The National Desk's Janae Bowens joins us with all the reasons behind that number. Of yeah. course, inflation a factor, interest rates a factor, really a lot of things are a factor right now. We do have you know, a housing shortage as well. Exactly, Jan. And higher prices are a key reason why so many renters have lost hope in home ownership. We met Ashley Nicole a few days ago. She was forced to move out of her Dallas apartment because of high prices. We were up to about $2,000, um, and that's before utilities or anything. She's not the only one with frustrations about her housing situation. Nearly 40% of renters think they'll never own a home. That number is up 27% compared to less than a year ago. That's according to a new survey from Redfin. When we came down here to Texas, we intended to buy a house, but we kept getting outbid. Um, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Lack of affordability is the top reason many renters don't believe they'll buy a home in the near future. Ability to save for a down payment, afford mortgage payments, and high mortgage rates are also roadblocks. We have a low inventory environment, which is bringing prices up even higher and mortgage rates aren't really easing the way that we're hoping they are. Um, and in the meantime, buyers are competing against historically high levels of cash buyers. Currently, mortgage rates are above 7%. The median home sale price is more than $378,000. And earlier this month, the median monthly housing payment hit an all-time high of $2,747. I'm almost 32. Um, I thought I would be able to, to buy a house by now. And another survey found more than one third of Gen Zers and millennials who plan to buy a home expect to receive a cash gift from family to help fund their down payment. Of course, Jan, this just shows how expensive home ownership has gotten. Oh, yeah, it really has. Thank you so much, Janae. Still ahead on the national desk, warning signs a whistleblower's new claims about the Baltimore Bridge collapse as the FBI opens a criminal investigation. And chaos at the pharmacy. Neighbors in a city struggling with theft, calling out soft on crime policies as video of the latest robbery goes viral online.
And are high interest rates the new norm in America? Why big bank economists are now changing their predictions on potential rate cuts this year. We're going to explain coming up in 90 seconds. And here at the live desk, we're waiting on new job numbers to come out from the Labor Department, of course, just a few hours from now at around 8.30 Eastern. So far, the labor market has been a lifeline for the economy as Americans struggle to pay for higher prices on everything from gas to groceries. In March, the U.S. recorded a blockbuster jobs growth, adding more than 303,000 jobs. Now, earlier this week, though, the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell pumped the brakes on any expectations of rate cuts, citing a lack of progress so far this year. Economists from major banks are now changing their initial forecast. For example, Bank of America economist now says they predict just one rate cut this year in December. That's down from the four they initially called for. Now, Bank of America security economist Michael Gape and giving us his insight, saying, quote, right here, 2024 is starting to look like 2015, but in reverse. Then the Fed signaled hikes it could not deliver. Now the Fed may be signaling cuts that the inflation data do not justify. Angela, thank you. A Port of Baltimore employee says he saw warning signs of electrical failure on the Dolly cargo ship before it left port and struck the key bridge. It comes after the FBI announced a criminal investigation into the collapse, seeking warning signs that may have been missed or ignored, like what crane operator Damian Tucker claims he witnessed firsthand. I was radioed up from the reefer mechanic and some of the longshoremen on the ship that was lashing containers that night that they were having electrical problems, getting power to the reefers. The Associated Press spoke with an anonymous source claiming that while the ship was docked, alarms went off on some of its refrigerated containers indicating an inconsistent inconsi power supply. The National Transportation Safety Board plans to release a preliminary report of its investigation in the coming weeks. Hawaii's attorney general released the first set of findings from an investigation into Maui's deadly wildfires. The report does not reveal the cause of the deadly fires, but did conclude high winds, down power lines, and low visibility created challenges for responding crews. The fires did kill at least 101 residents and destroyed thousands of homes, adding up to more than $5.5 billion in damages. The second phase of the AG's report is expected to come out later this year. 2023 was the deadliest year for gas-related home explosions in nearly two decades. Spotlight on America's Angie Moreski has been tracking these catastrophic blasts and takes a closer look at what's causing them and whether you should be worried about your own home. This catastrophic home explosion captured on doorbell video was the deadliest nationwide in 2023, killing six people in the suburban neighborhood of Rustic Ridge, just east of Pittsburgh. These are just some of the sudden devastating explosions that made 2023 the deadliest year since 2004 for gas-fed explosions, with 23 fatalities, more than four times higher than the year before. 
Rich Meyer is a fire explosion investigator. How often is it natural gas, gas pipelines involved? Probably half or more. Aging infrastructure, old corroded gas pipelines are more likely to crack and leak, increasing the risk, he says, of gas migrating underground into people's homes and causing explosions. There are lines that have been in place for over 100 years, and they are breaking. Besides aging infrastructure, other significant issues that can cause leaks that lead to explosions include construction work where pipes can be damaged during digging and malfunctioning equipment. Malfunctioning equipment was the cause of a massive deadly explosion in 2016 in Silver Spring, Maryland at the Flower Branch Apartments. Five adults and two children died. Sometimes when I come out, I think I can smell it. Isidro Vargas will never forget the terror of that night. I saw people jumping from the building. It's been terrible, I can tell you. Investigators concluded a malfunctioning mercury regulator on a gas meter caused the deadly blast. And human error caused a massive explosion here just a few miles away in 2022 at the Friendly Garden Apartments, also in Silver Spring. A maintenance worker doing repairs accidentally cut a gas line instead of a water line. That one. Alex Jacquois lives at Friendly Garden. Boom. And then when I look out through the window, and then I saw the flame. The National Transportation Safety Board investigates major explosions that lead to fatalities, significant injury, and property loss. But not all explosions are required to be reported to the federal government, making it harder to determine patterns across the country. What would the benefit of having a comprehensive database be? The more information you have, the better armed you are when it comes to fixing the problem. If you use gas in your home, one way to protect yourself is to get an in-home gas detector. I got this one on Amazon for 20 bucks. All you do is plug it into the wall near a gas appliance. Then, if gas builds up, an alarm sounds warning you to get out. A small investment to potentially save lives. For Spotlight on America, I'm Angie Moreski. Still ahead this morning, barring blockades, Washington state lawmakers pushing to increase penalties for disruptive and illegal protests. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a New York community remembering the life of a fallen officer to chaos at a CVS pharmacy caught on camera in the nation's capital, we are taking the pulse of America. But we start in Washington State, where there is a new push to crack down on disruptive protests. 
Right in the middle of peak travel time, pro-Palestinian protesters used their bodies and cars to block the expressway to SeaTac Airport. So intense, some frantic travelers walked to the terminal instead. We do not support you interrupting the lives and safety of your fellow citizens. Republican Representative Spencer Hutchins has renewed his call for a new law, one that would make intentionally obstructing a freeway a felony. He and other lawmakers tried to get it passed after a similar protest on I-5 in Seattle in January. That legislation got no traction. What kind of penalties are we talking about? We're talking about fines of anywhere from $1,000 to $6,000 or $10,000, depending on whether you are a follower or a leader. Uh, jail time, 60 days, up to 60 days in jail. The airport protesters are charged with misdemeanors, a max of 90 days in jail and a $1,000 fine. The I-5 protesters have yet to be charged, but they are facing possible gross misdemeanor charges. I've been here for about seven years. I never heard anything about police or anybody get shot around here. Neighbors reacting to the evening after one police officer was shot blocks away from their homes near North Main and Western Avenue. He had heard the shots and she said, I know those were gunshots. This came after a routine attempt to pull over a speeding car. Only the suspect wouldn't stop, even driving through a one-way street the wrong way. At the time, police chose not to chase the suspect out of concern for safety of the neighbors. We drove some of the route that police took. I want to thank the Albany police um, for doing a really fantastic job. I feel like I've got to be aware of whatever is around you all the time because you never know what's going to happen. It's been a normal day at the CVS at New Jersey and M Street, but last night, a scooter rider in the store, someone running, someone wearing a mask, what appears to be a group of young people causing a scene in this cell phone video taken by a customer. There are people in juveniles that are stealing these products and they're not being held accountable. Most of them are young. They know that they're only going to serve one day in jail or not have any consequences at the end of the day. It's unclear if the people from last night were minors. We've blurred everyone's faces since no charges have been put out. It's been ongoing ever since I've gotten here. Elisa says she's dealt with crime since she moved to this neighborhood two years ago. She's speaking out and encouraging others to do the same. It just comes down to working with, you know, our lawmakers and our council members, our ANC, and having them recognize what's actually happening in this area and that it's scary for us. Still ahead in our next hour of the National Desk. First in history, Senate Democrats stop an impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas as Republicans raise concerns about the border crisis. And breaking out of Indonesia, the island issuing its highest level volcano alert after this eruption. You're looking at right here, sending ash thousands of feet in the air. More details ahead, 90 seconds.
A tsunami alert has been triggered in Indonesia after at least five large volcanic eruptions happened just over the past 24 hours at Ruang Mountain. Officials warn the mountain could collapse into the sea causing a tsunami. Officials say those eruptions sent ash thousands of feet into the air. You're looking at some video here this morning. We know hundreds have already been evacuated from that region and thousands more are still being ordered to leave at this point. We're going to continue to monitor for any details, any developments throughout the morning right here at the live desk. Now that is our time for this hour of the National Desk. Now here's a look at America's news and weather where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. There are no big storms in the forecast in the Northeast, but we're tracking a few rounds of showers. First one this morning, here we are 7 a.m. Uh, a line is running from northern New York all the way down through southern New England. This should peter out during the course of the afternoon, but notice there will be at least a chance for showers into and throughout the afternoon. Our next round is this feature right here that moves into the area on Friday. That's 2.30 in the afternoon. It should arrive in New England for Friday night and extending into very early Saturday. I'm meteorologist Jasmine Lomax with a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll start off with a few showers moving out of the area. It looks much better by the afternoon. However, another weather maker is going to lead to showers on Friday, and that's how we start the day. The rain will continue into the afternoon. High temperatures will reach the 40s through the 80s. Then overnight, we'll start to get cooler, dropping to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Good Thursday morning. I'm meteorologist Michael Larenberg with a look at your southeast regional forecast. We are looking at a mix of clouds and sunshine through parts of the southeast, but it will be mostly sunny from Virginia through south and North Carolina. Clouds, but little rain moving through parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. There will be some showers near the Mississippi River Valley at the Arkansas line and a line of storms probably heading into western sections of Tennessee and also uh, northern sections of Virginia late in the day. Highs 80s to near 90. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. We've got scattered rain and thunderstorms firing up across the central part of the Midwest today, and that'll race its way to the east. Now, behind that, it's going to be a lot cooler. Check out Bismarck, 41 for the high for the day today, 39 tomorrow. That rain shifts its way into the Ohio Valley overnight tonight into your Friday morning and racing out quickly, and that's going to leave all of us dry heading into the start of the weekend on Saturday. Definitely some cool temperatures, though, 50s and 40s all across the Midwest. Good Thursday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Suchi and look at our forecast across the region today and we'll be on the lookout for a few strong to perhaps a severe thunderstorm stretching from San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up into a uh, Little Rock and Shreveport, especially as we head through the evening hours. Could get a couple storms of some wind and some hail. We step in that our forecast Friday and outside some patchy clouds, a little bit of a calmer day with a few showers possible. Notice those temperatures will be running a little on the cooler side Friday afternoon. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Those very warm temperatures from Nevada into Arizona, getting into Phoenix in the mid 90s. Now up to the Pacific Northwest, we still have very cool temperatures in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon in the 50s. That goes into Montana where we're staying so cool with still that cool low pressure, bringing in some mountain snow showers in the afternoon. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Devastating damage. All of a sudden, just heard the wind start to pick up, house start to shake, and all of a sudden, I just felt the entire house move. Severe weather leaving a path of destruction as millions of Americans brace for more storms today. Sounding the alarm. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. Records do, in fact, exist. I know this because I've personally passed them to the FBI. Whistleblowers go on the record and testify that Boeing knew about safety issues with commercial planes. Hanging by a thread. I'm operating with the smallest margin in U.S. history. I have a one vote margin. The only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. In an election year, having a speaker who can't do the job is really bad. The House leadership in jeopardy as Republicans fight over sending taxpayer dollars to foreign countries. And footing the bill. It's a big middle finger uh, to working class folks who either paid off their student loans or didn't take them out in the first place. How much you could end up paying for someone else's student loan debt. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jan Jeff Code. It is Thursday, April 18th, and more states right now bracing for severe weather with a major plunge in temperatures set to sweep in. It also comes after days of brutal storms, including winds so strong in some areas they literally tore a home right off its foundation. This happened in Ohio. Let's get right to Angela Brown at the live desk for the latest forecasts and all the damage that we're seeing right now. Good morning to you. And good morning to you, Jan. A live look at the National Desk Radar where these severe thunderstorm warnings and are in effect in some cases in pink over parts of Kansas and Missouri. Now, the lower Ohio Valley braces for another round of storms today. We're going to have a look ahead at today's threats in just a minute. But first, brand new video just into the live desk of Berman, Ohio, about 40 miles southeast of Columbus, where the nice guy, you see it there, lit up with a lightning show. Just updated these numbers for you as well. Thousands in the dark across West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Missouri, also Tennessee. Now take a look at this video out of Ohio as well. A major damage inside of a family dollar store. You can see when you look down at the ground, a lot of items are just tossed around all over the store on the floor there. And now to a live look over St. Louis, Missouri, as another round of severe thunderstorms threatens that region today as well, bringing strong winds, large hail, and even the chance for tornadoes. And here's a look at the region that will likely see storm threats this afternoon, spanning from the lower Ohio Valley all the way south to Del Rio. Now to a live look over Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, one of the uh, cities that Starting today, actually, we'll start to feel temperatures drop by Saturday. Nearly 200 million Americans will feel below average temperatures. The most noticeable thing here, the most noticeable changes we're talking about are expected in the high plains where the highest temperatures could reach 15 to 20 degrees below average. We're keeping an eye on all of that this all morning long right here at the live desk and online all the time at the National Weather Desk, part of the National Desk. .com. Angela, thanks so much. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country would not bow to outside pressure to hold off on a response to Iran's attack. While it's still unclear how Israel will respond, U.S. officials have said they expect any military action to be limited in scope. Israeli defense leaders right now only saying their response would be decided by them at a time of their choosing. The the U.S. now expected to try to block a United Nations vote tomorrow that would give Palestine full U.N. membership, effectively recognizing a Palestinian state. If it passes a Security Council vote today, the U.S. could move to veto the resolution. And the battle in the House heating up over foreign aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene still threatening to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson if he sides with Democrats. Well, last night, Johnson did add a border security bill, but it will not be part of the final aid package that caused some Republican colleagues to question his leadership and priorities. Johnson, though, now appears poised to lean on Democrats to pass some of the bills. For the first time in history, the Senate has exonerated a public official who refused to resign without holding a trial or reviewing evidence. Republicans slamming Democrats for rejecting the impeachment charges against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Yesterday, Senate Democrats did vote to dismiss the articles the House delivered. In the 237 years of our nation's history, I don't know that there has been a more shameful day in the United States Senate than today. 
What we just witnessed was a travesty. It was a travesty to the United States Constitution, and it was a travesty to the American people. The articles said Mayorkas willfully and systematically ignored U.S. immigration laws. He is now set to testify before the Senate today about his budget requests. We're now learning a foreign national charged in a double murder used President Biden's CBP-1 app to enter the U.S. News reports saying that Haitian migrant Canole Baptiste got into the U.S. by making an appointment on the CBP-1 app last summer. New York authorities say two weeks ago he did stab and kill his two roommates who were also Haitian. The number of Chinese nationals illegally entering the U.S. between ports of entry is skyrocketing. Customs and Border Protection report that from October to March, agents caught 24,296 Chinese nationals. Well, that's already more than the 24,125 caught in all of the prior fiscal year and does not include the numbers at ports of entry. And breaking this morning, law enforcement across several states are working to restore services after widespread outages overnight the black calls to police and other emergency agencies. This morning, some services are still spotty. In South Dakota, the State Department of Public Safety says if you cannot call 911, you can text them or call the non-emergency line. The city of Del Rio in Texas is also reporting issues, although police there say it was a problem with the phone carrier, not the city's system. And all Four states are really feeling the impacts here. We already told you about South Dakota and Texas. Now let's talk about portions of Nebraska and really let's talk about Nevada, including Las Vegas, where we're um, taking a look now. You can see it over there. It's still dark there on the strip this morning. Las Vegas police reported issues there were resolved just before 915 last night, several hours after these outages even started. So far, though, no word on what caused it. Again, services will be down in several states this morning. We are watching for any new details. If we learn anything, of course, we're going to share it with you right here at the Live Desk and online at thenationaldesk.com. Thank you, Angela. New developments in President Biden's classified documents case. Some lawmakers now warning of national security concerns after analyzing the classified records that Biden had in his personal possession. Florida Congressman Mike Waltz wrote, I just reviewed a portion of Biden's classified documents that were taken from his basement by special counsel Her, They were highly classified and relevant to current national security threats. We need an immediate damage assessment from the intelligence community. New testimony on Capitol Hill now accusing Army officials of lying about their response to the Capitol riot. Four National Guard whistleblowers just testified before a House oversight panel slamming a Defense Department report that claims leadership acted appropriately. The whistleblowers testified they were in place and ready to help on January 6th, but military leadership, they say, failed to authorize them to help in a timely manner, and that leadership then lied about their failure to act. We had a force equipped and ready to respond, and despite the inaccuracies of the DODIG report, we had a plan and would have liked the opportunity to try. Only at 5.09 p.m. in the early evening, which I wrote down in my wheel book, was the D.C. Guard given order to deploy and move to the Capitol to assist Capitol Police. We arrived too late. The D.C. National Guard was ready to help and assist Capitol Police, but we were not allowed to do our job due to paralyzed decision-making by Acting Secretary of Defense Chris Miller and Secretary of the Army Ryan McCarthy. The whistleblowers testified these decisions delayed the National Guard response by three hours and 19 minutes. Former President Trump and several of his administration officials have maintained they had called up the National Guard days before January 6th to help with crowd control and emergencies. More than a dozen U.S. attorneys general are accusing Bank of America of targeting customers for their religious and political beliefs. The 15 AGs signed a letter criticizing the bank for a pattern of discriminatory behavior. The letter claims conservative clients were either denied accounts, had their accounts closed, or were denied basic services like ATM use. The House did approve a bill that would limit how the government can purchase your online data. It's called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act, and it now requires law enforcement or other government agencies to first get a warrant before buying information from third-party companies that collect your information from apps. The president plans to forgive more student loan debt for more than 270,000 more borrowers to the tune of another $7 billion in transfer debt. 
the national desks. Matt Galka is here with us now. Good morning to you, Matt. A top business school in the country says it will cost taxpayers a lot in the long run. Someone's got to pay for this. <laughs> yeah, good morning, Jen. The Wharton Business School projects that canceling the $7 billion along with the other student debt plans the president has put forward won't end up costing taxpayers just a one-off $7 billion bill. It'll be half a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Too many Americans, especially young people, are saddled with unsustainable debts in exchange for college degree. President Joe Biden has tried to make canceling student loans a pillar of his time in office. The administration's latest announcement aims to cancel another $7.4 billion of debt, mostly through waiving high amounts of accrued interest. The Penn Wharton budget model has the new plan, along with other previous debt forgiveness plans, costing taxpayers big over the next decade. All told, taxpayers could be on the hook for $559 billion for the next 10 years. It's a big middle finger. Uh, to working class folks who either paid off their student loans or didn't take them out in the first place. Missouri Republican Senator Eric Schmidt sued the Biden administration over debt forgiveness in 2022 when he was his state's attorney general. The Supreme Court eventually stopped the president's last debt forgiveness effort. The White House says the new plan uses a different authority to get around the Supreme Court ruling. It's unconstitutional. He has no authority under statute to do it. It was struck down before. I think this is a cynical election year ploy. The $559 billion is equivalent to more than six years of the annual budget of the Department of Education. Even some Democrats admit canceling student loans doesn't get to the root cause of the high costs of education. I think the intent is good, uh, clearly, uh, to provide relief of student debt. I think it's how you go about it that I think for many is troubling and uh, needs more work. Now, if the proposal is finalized, the canceled accrued interest could go into effect as early as this fall, right around election time. But the plan will almost certainly be taken to court. Reporting live on Capitol Hill, I'm Matt Galka for the National Desk, America's News Now. Matt, thanks so much. Ahead this morning, fighting anti-Semitism. More college leaders taking the hot seat on Capitol Hill to explain how they are trying to stop the alarming campus trend. And here at the live desk, we're breaking down the alarming accounts by whistleblowers revealing what they call dangerous oversights in the manufacturing process of Boeing planes. What lawmakers plan to do, possibly coming up in 90 seconds. Flight fears mounting this morning after two back-to-back -back Senate hearings revealing what could be disastrous issues for, with some of Boeing's most popular planes. Right now, lawmakers are considering new leg legislation to regulate Boeing, but getting anything passed on Capitol Hill could be a long shot. Right now, Congress really isn't agreeing on much. A whistleblower testified on Wednesday raising concerns about Boeing's manufacturing protocol, claiming the company took shortcuts when it made their 777 and 787 Dreamliner jets. He said crews assembling the plane failed to fill 
failed to properly fill tiny gaps when joining together parts of the fuselage. He says his concerns were met with threats. Again, I raised concerns internally. I was sidelined. I was told to shut up. I received physical threats. My, 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 my boss said, I would have killed someone who said what you said in a meeting. And then this is not a safety culture when you get threatened by bringing issues of safety concerns. Lawmakers are calling those accounts more than troubling, but Boeing is pushing back on these accusations, saying they are inaccurate. But for the past five years, the company also faced federal questioning and also scrutiny following two deadly crashes of a different Boeing model. That's the 737 MAX. And adding to all that pressure is what happened back in January, where a door plug blew off mid-takeoff on an Alaska Airlines flight, making some people, just looking at this, making some people more fearful to fly. Angela, thank you. Republican lawmakers in California accuse Democrats of watering down a bill that would make it a felony to buy or sell a child under 18 for sex. Democrats, though, would only advance the bill if the age limit was lowered to 15 for a felony and remain a misdemeanor for criminals charged with attempting to buy a 16 or 17 year old. A high school student now charged after attacking a teacher was caught on camera and the video going viral. It all happened at Parkland High School in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Police arrested the student on Tuesday and charged him with three misdemeanors. Fallout for the activists who blocked traffic as part of a nationwide protest Monday as lawmakers in Washington state want to make it a felony to intentionally obstruct highways there. This is after dozens of activists blocked traffic to the Seattle Tacoma Airport. We need to put some more teeth in the law to say this behavior, these actions are unlawful. We will make it a felony. What kind of penalties are we talking about? We're talking about fines of anywhere from $1,000 to $6,000 or $10,000, depending on whether you are a follower or a leader. Uh, jail time, 60 days, up to 60 days in jail. A group of Washington lawmakers will now try to pass a bill they pushed for last legislative session, which would increase penalties for blocking freeways. The current law is a misdemeanor, carrying up to 90 days in jail. New efforts to confront growing concerns about anti-Semitism on college campuses. National Desk's Kayla Gaskins reports from Capitol Hill. It was the president of Columbia University's turn to sit in the hot seat on Capitol Hill. Columbia strives to be a community free of discrimination and hate. Answering concerns regarding reports of rising anti-Semitism on campus following Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. The anti-Semitism on our campus makes me sick to my stomach. And we are taking steps to address it. Columbia, the center of several viral videos depicting alleged anti-Semitism. Columbia's leadership team attempting to avoid the fate of Harvard and UPenn, whose presidents lost their positions following a similar hearing in December, where they were seen to sidestep a question about campus protesters chanting Intifada, which critics say is a direct call for the genocide of Jews. Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. Clearer answers were given Wednesday. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Columbia's code of conduct. Dr. Shafiq. Yes, it does. MIT's president sat for the same December hearing as Harvard and UPenn, but managed to keep her position. We spoke with MIT grad student Talia Khan. It's a much deeper problem than just getting rid of the president. And we've seen that at Harvard and Penn in the past few months. Even though the president's gone, uh, you know, the, the climate hasn't shifted so dramatically. Meanwhile, the University of Southern California canceling their valedictorian speech, citing safety concerns. The Muslim student says she's being silenced by anti-Palestinian hatred. Jewish students at USC say she supports the abolishment of Israel. The abolishment of the state of Israel, I'd like to clarify, is the abolishment of an apartheid system. The Anti-Defamation League and the FBI reported historic levels of anti-Semitism since October 7th. The ADL says that spike shows no signs of slowing. I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting. Florida public schools are now required to teach students the dangers of communism. Governor Ron DeSantis just signed the measure into law. He said it will require teachers to explain the tactics used by American communist movements as well as negative events that took place under communist regimes. It takes effect in the school year starting in 2026.
Diversity and equity staff jobs in North Carolina's public university system could be on the chopping block after the Committee on University Governance voted to reverse and replace existing DEI policy. Another vote is set for next month, and if approved, the repeal would take effect immediately. Amazon Fresh is evidently ditching its cashierless checkout system at its grocery stores and maybe trying to sell the same technology to a store near you. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, joins us with more on this move. Seems a little bit convoluted, so they're trying to get rid of technology and put clerks back into place and give that technology or think they can sell it to someone else, correct? Exactly, Jan. And it seems like a situation of one man's trash is another man's treasure. Amazon says they are removing Just Walk Out technology and their Amazon Fresh grocery stores because customers want a shopping assistant to travel with them in big grocery stores. Now, company leaders think the technology is better suited for smaller stores because oftentimes customers want to get in and get out of those shops quickly. And according to the Associated Press, Amazon wants to sell the technology to more than 120 third-party businesses by the end of the year. Now, this could be an uphill battle, seeing as they're trying to sell the very thing they're removing. Now, from here's a little bit more about how the technology actually works. Once payment, whatever the method, has been authorized, a virtual cart is created and the gates will open. Let's walk inside. Once in the store, the cameras above, coupled with shelf sensors, will detect items removed from shelves by a consumer and will add that item to their virtual cart. Now the company says no facial recognition is used. Once the customer is done shopping, they'll exit through the gate and will be automatically charged. Now there have been a lot of social media posts claiming that the system was powered by people in India who manually added up items and carts as customers shopped. And Jan Amazon confirms using human reviewers for the technology, but says customers are not being watched by live people in India. But according to the AP, Amazon is declining to share how many people review and label videos when there's a glitch in the system. The company also de to de declined to comment on how many reviews have had to be conducted. Thank you, today. And breaking out of Las Vegas, a driver slammed into a group of people at a bus stop, killing two people, including a child. What we're learning from police coming up in 90 seconds. And welcome back, everyone. We have a live look this morning office over Las Vegas right behind me after a deadly overnight crash when a wrong way driver plowed into a bus stop that killed two people, including a child. Three others are now recovering this morning. Now, here's a look at what that uh, scene looked like right after the crash. I mean, you can see so many police lights here in the distance. Lots of traffic here backed up. So many officers on the scene. Now, police believe the driver could have been under the influence or even speeding at the time of the crash. Keep in mind that this all happened just around 7.30 p.m. Minutes after reports started rolling in of those 911 service outages we told you about earlier this hour that spanned across the Las Vegas Valley and even several other states. Now, we are working with our reporters on the ground in Las Vegas, KSNV, to bring you any new details that come in this morning right here at the Live Desk and online all the time at thenationaldesk.com.
Ahead in our next half hour, red threat. Lobbyists on behalf of China lining lawmakers' pockets as Washington considers a ban of CCP-controlled TikTok. Also, priced out. The American dream of owning a home slipping out of reach for many as high costs and interest rates keep buyers at bay. First, here's a look at America's news and weather now, where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. There are no big storms in the forecast in the Northeast, but we're tracking a few rounds of showers. First one this morning, here we are 7 a.m. Uh, a line is running from northern New York all the way down through southern New England. This should peter out during the course of the afternoon, but notice there will be at least a chance for showers into and throughout the afternoon. Our next round is this feature right here that moves into the area on Friday. That's 2.30 in the afternoon. It should arrive in New England for Friday night and extending into very early Saturday. I'm meteorologist Jasmine Lomax with a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll start off with a few showers moving out of the area. It looks much better by the afternoon. However, another weather maker is going to lead to showers on Friday, and that's how we start the day. The rain will continue into the afternoon. High temperatures will reach the 40s through the 80s. Then overnight, we'll start to get cooler, dropping to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Good Thursday morning. I'm meteorologist Michael Larenberg with a look at your southeast regional forecast. We are looking at a mix of clouds and sunshine through parts of the southeast, but it will be mostly sunny from Virginia through south of North Carolina. Clouds, but little rain moving through parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. There will be some showers near the Mississippi River Valley at the Arkansas line and a line of storms probably heading into western sections of Tennessee and also uh, northern sections of Virginia late in the day. Highs 80s to near 90. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. We've got scattered rain and thunderstorms firing up across the central part of the Midwest today, and that'll race its way to the east. Now, behind that, it's going to be a lot cooler. Check out Bismarck, 41 for the high for the day today, 39 tomorrow. That rain shifts its way into the Ohio Valley overnight tonight into your Friday morning and racing out quickly, and that's going to leave all of us dry heading into the start of the weekend on Saturday. Definitely some cool temperatures, though, 50s and 40s all across the Midwest. Good Thursday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Suchi and look at our forecast across the region today and we'll be on the lookout for a few strong to perhaps a severe thunderstorm stretching from San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up into a uh, Little Rock and Shreveport, especially as we head through the evening hours. Could get a couple storms with some wind and some hail. We step in that our forecast Friday and outside some patchy clouds, a little bit of a calmer day with a few showers possible. Notice those temperatures will be running a little on the cooler side Friday afternoon. Good morning. I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Those very warm temperatures from Nevada into Arizona, getting into Phoenix in the mid 90s. Now up to the Pacific Northwest, we still have very cool temperatures in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon in the 50s. That goes into Montana, where we're staying so cool with still that cool low pressure, bringing in some mountain snow showers in the afternoon. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Now on the National Desk, America's News Now, priced out. The American dream of buying and owning a home getting crushed by red-hot inflation and rising interest rates as new data shows renters are feeling stuck. Plus... There's no other way to describe it. It's surrender. It's disappointing. I'm very disappointed. The only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. Funding fight, a vote set on where more than 95 billion taxpayer dollars could go, putting the House Speaker's position at risk. And the path of destruction, communities in America's heartland that are already reporting major damage, preparing for yet another round of severe weather. Thanks for joining us. You are watching the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It's Thursday, April 18th, and weather alerts still remain in, in place for some already hard hit areas. Angela Brown at the live desk tracking the very latest for us right now. Good morning to you. And good morning to you, Jan. We have a live look at the National Desk radar this morning as we track several weather alerts in the Ohio Valley. Some uh, severe weather alerts just expired in the last half hour, actually. We'll have a look ahead at today's threats in just a minute. But first, we got this brand new video for you just into the live desk. You're looking at it here out of Berman, Ohio. About 40 miles southeast of Columbus where the night nice sky really getting lit, lit up with a lightning show you can see right here on your screen. Now we just updated these numbers for you as well regarding power outages. More than 10,000 are in the dark across West Virginia and thousands more in Pennsylvania, Missouri and Tennessee right now. And take a look at this video out of Ohio. Major damage inside of a family dollar store. You can see on the ground, on the floor there of the store, some items just tossed across the store. And now to um, a live look over St. Louis, Missouri, as another round of severe thunderstorms threatening that region you're looking at right here, bringing strong wind, large hail, and maybe even some tornadoes. Here's a look at the region that will likely see those storm threats this afternoon, spanning from the lower Ohio Valley all the way south to Del Rio. Now to a live look at Minneapolis, Minnesota, or to a look here at Minneapolis, Minnesota. One of the cities today, uh, starting today, will start to feel temperatures really drop here by Saturday. Nearly 200 million Americans will feel below average temperatures. The most noticeable changes are expected in the high plains, where the Highest temperatures could reach 15, to maybe even 20 degrees below average. Now, we are keeping our eyes on all of this all morning long right here at the live desk and online all the time at the National Weather Desk, part of the nationaldesk.com. New developments in Israel's plans to respond to Iran's barrage of missile strikes. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country will make its own decision when and where to strike. Israel's finance minister said the response should be fierce and severe to deter future attacks. U.S. officials, though, have said they do expect any response if it does involve military action would be limited in scope. Meantime, this morning in Washington, House lawmakers sorting through a long list of proposed bills that do have the support of President Biden. House Speaker Mike Johnson and officially set up a Saturday night vote on the foreign aid funding despite some backlash from his own party. I don't have all my Republicans who agree on that rule, and that means the only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. Altogether, the bills cost $95.3 billion and address aid for Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine. A key difference from the Senate's package is that $9.5 billion in economic aid to Ukraine would be structured as a loan, but the repayment terms would be set by President Biden. 80% of the money that would be allocated in this legislation is for replenishment of our own weapons and stocks. I mean, this is uh, something that makes sense. We're, we're, what we're doing is funding America's industrial defense base. These are jobs in America building weapons. My concern about this package is it's $95 billion of foreign aid when A, we're $34.5 trillion in debt, but B, we're also dealing with wide open borders. And, and central to our entire debate over the last year, as you know, has been the importance of making sure we secure the borders of the United States. In an attempt to get more Republicans on board, Speaker Johnson also introduced a renewed border security bill that could be voted on Saturday. It is the same as the House's H.R. 2 package that passed last year, but replaces funding for an E-Verify requirement for employers with funding for border states to build walls and reimburse law enforcement agencies for border 
enforcement expenses. Both chambers are scheduled to be in recess next week, and it's not clear if the Senate will stay in Washington if those bills are passed to do their own vote. TikTok could face a day of reckoning in Washington very soon. Congress fast-tracking a bill that would force the app to be sold or face a ban here in the U.S. The National Desk's Matt Galka is here right now. Good morning to you, Matt. It looks like China now getting really heavily involved here. Yeah, good morning, Jen. Let's talk about that bill first. TikTok is owned by Beijing-based ByteDance, and because of privacy and data concerns, the House passed a bill last month that says TikTok must be sold to an American company or get banned here in the U.S. That bill is now tied into that foreign aid package you were just talking about that's set to be voted on this weekend, meaning if it's wrapped up with other priorities, it has a better chance of getting signed into law. Politico reports the Chinese embassy has gotten involved, meeting with staffers and downplaying national security concerns. About 170 million Americans use TikTok, and the bill has gotten significant backlash from young people and business owners who use the app for entertainment and to make money. So definitely something to keep an eye on during that vote this weekend. Reporting live on Capitol Hill, I'm Matt Galka for the National Desk, American, America's News. All right, Matt, thanks so much. In a reversal, President Biden now taking a page out of former President Trump's playbook to get tougher on China. Yesterday, he called on his administration to consider tripling tariffs on Chinese steel while visiting the United Steelworkers headquarters in Pittsburgh. The Trump campaign blasted Biden's request, calling it too little, too late. The people of Poland love him. They really do. They really love you. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish, but he's done a fantastic job, and he's my friend. And we had uh, four great years together, four great years. So let's do the math to do it again. Former President Trump meeting with more conservative foreign leaders while on the campaign trail. Last night he spoke with Polish President Andrzej Duda to discuss ongoing wars and a proposal for NATO countries to spend 3% of their GDP on defense. New polling out this morning does have Trump leading Biden in five out of the six battleground states. According to one poll, Trump up 51 to 45 percent in Arizona and Georgia. He's up 52 to 42. Michigan, 51 to 45 percent. Nevada has some 51 to 44 percent. And in Pennsylvania, they currently have him at 49 to 45 percent. Some Americans probably wish they could move, but existing mortgage rates are just too low to give up. Homeowners right now feeling paralyzed by current rates and it's creating this lock in effect for the housing market across the country. Higher rates are responsible for about 1.3 million fewer home sales this spring compared to last spring. And nearly 40% of renters think they will never own a home. At the National Desk's Janae Bowen's joining us right now with the numbers. Good morning to you, Janae. So many factors here, right? Inflation, you got high interest rates, you got this housing shortage. There's a lot of reasons why renters right now feel like they're stuck. Exactly, Jan. And higher prices are a key reason why so many renters have lost hope in home ownership. We met Ashley Nicole a few days ago. She was forced to move out of her Dallas apartment because of high prices. We were up to about $2,000. Um, and that's before utilities or anything. She's not the only one with frustrations about her housing situation. Nearly 40% of renters think they'll never own a home. That number is up 27% compared to less than a year ago. That's according to a new survey from Redfin. When we came down here to Texas, we intended to buy a house, but we kept getting outbid. Um, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Lack of affordability is the top reason many renters don't believe they'll buy a home in the near future. Ability to save for a down payment, afford mortgage payments, and high mortgage rates are also roadblocks. We have a low inventory environment, which is bringing prices up even higher, and mortgage rates aren't really easing the way that we're hoping they are. Um, and in the meantime, buyers are competing against historically high levels of cash buyers. Currently, mortgage rates are above 7%. The median home sale price is more than $378,000. And earlier this month, the median monthly housing payment hit an all-time high of $2,747. I'm almost 32. Um, I thought I would be able to, to buy a house by now. And another, another survey found more than a third of Gen Zers and millennials who plan to buy a home expect to receive a cash gift from family to help fund their down payment. Of course, Jan, this just shows how expensive home ownership has gotten. 
It's gotten pretty bad out there today. Thanks so much. Still ahead on the national desk, warning signs. The whistleblower's new claims about the Baltimore Bridge collapse as the FBI opens a criminal investigation. And chaos at the pharmacy. Neighbors in a city struggling with theft, calling out soft on crime policies as video of the latest robbery goes viral online. And our high interest rates, the new norm in America, why economists are now changing their tune. We'll explain coming up in 90 seconds. And here at the live desk, we're waiting on new job numbers to come out from the Labor Department just about an hour from now. We're talking 8.30 Eastern. So far, the labor market has been a lifeline for the economy as Americans struggle to pay for higher prices on everything from gas to groceries. In March, the U.S. recorded a blockbuster jobs growth, adding more than 303,000 jobs Earlier this week, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell pumped the brakes on any expectations of rate cuts, citing a lack of progress so far this year. Economists changing their initial forecast. For example, Bank of America economists are now predicting just one rate cut this year in December. Now that's down from the four they initially called for. Bank of America securities economist Michael Gapin giving us his insight saying this right here quote 2024 is starting to look like 2015 but in reverse then the Fed signaled hikes it could not deliver now the Fed may be signaling cuts that the inflation data do not justify a Port of Baltimore employee says he saw warning signs of electrical failure on the Dolly cargo ship before it left port and struck the key bridge it comes after the FBI announced a criminal investigation into the collapse, seeking warning signs that may have been missed or ignored, like what crane operator Damian Tucker claims he witnessed firsthand. I was radioed up from the reefer mechanic and some of the longshoremen on the ship that was lashing containers that night that they were having electrical problems getting power to the reefers. The Associated Press spoke with an anonymous source claiming that while the ship was docked, alarms went off on some of its refrigerated containers indicating an inconsistent power supply. The National Transportation Safety Board plans to release a preliminary report of its investigation in the coming weeks. Hawaii's Attorney General did release the first set of findings from an investigation into Maui's deadly wildfires. The report does not reveal the cause but concluded high winds down power lines, low visibility did create challenges for responding crews. The fires killed at least 101 residents and destroyed thousands of homes, adding up to more than five and a half billion dollars in damages. The second phase of the AG's report is expected to come out later this year. 2023 was the deadliest year for gas related home explosions in nearly two decades. Spotlight on America's Angie Moreski has been tracking these catastrophic blasts and takes a closer look at what's causing them and whether you should be worried about your own home. 
This catastrophic home explosion captured on doorbell video was the deadliest nationwide in 2023, killing six people in the suburban neighborhood of Rustic Ridge, just east of Pittsburgh. These are just some of the sudden devastating explosions that made 2023 the deadliest year since 2004 for gas-fed explosions, with 23 fatalities, more than four times higher than the year before. Rich Meyer is a fire explosion investigator. How often is it natural gas, gas pipelines involved? Probably half or more. Aging infrastructure, old corroded gas pipelines are more likely to crack and leak, increasing the risk, he says, of gas migrating underground into people's homes and causing explosions. There are lines that have been in place for over 100 years, and they are breaking. Besides aging infrastructure, other significant issues that can cause leaks that lead to explosions include construction work where pipes can be damaged during digging and malfunctioning equipment. Malfunctioning equipment was the cause of a massive deadly explosion in 2016 in Silver Spring, Maryland at the Flower Branch Apartments. Five adults and two children died. Sometimes when I come out, I think I can smell it. Isidro Vargas will never forget the terror of that night. I saw people jumping from the building. It's been terrible, I can tell you. Investigators concluded a malfunctioning mercury regulator on a gas meter caused the deadly blast. And human error caused a massive explosion here just a few miles away in 2022 at the Friendly Garden Apartments, also in Silver Spring. A maintenance worker doing repairs accidentally cut a gas line instead of a water line. That one. Alex Jacquois lives at Friendly Garden. Boom. And then when I look out through the window, and then I saw the flame. The National Transportation Safety Board investigates major explosions that lead to fatalities, significant injury, and property loss. But not all explosions are required to be reported to the federal government, making it harder to determine patterns across the country. What would the benefit of having a comprehensive database be? The more information you have, the better armed you are when it comes to fixing the problem. If you use gas in your home, one way to protect yourself is to get an in-home gas detector. I got this one on Amazon for 20 bucks. All you do is plug it into the wall near a gas appliance. Then, if gas builds up, an alarm sounds warning you to get out. A small investment to potentially save lives. For Spotlight on America, I'm Angie Moreski. Still ahead this morning, barring blockades, Washington state lawmakers pushing to increase penalties for disruptive and illegal protests.
this is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a New York community remembering the life of a fallen officer to chaos at a CVS pharmacy caught on camera in the nation's capital, we are taking the pulse of America. But we start in Washington State, where there is a new push to crack down on disruptive protests. Right in the middle of peak travel time, pro-Palestinian protesters use their bodies and cars to block the expressway to SeaTac Airport. So intense, some frantic travelers walk to the terminal instead. We do not support you interrupting the lives and safety of your fellow citizens. Republican Representative Spencer Hutchins has renewed his call for a new law, one that would make intentionally obstructing a freeway a felony. He and other lawmakers tried to get it passed after a similar protest on I-5 in Seattle in January. That legislation got no traction. What kind of penalties are we talking about? We're talking about fines of anywhere from $1,000 to $6,000 or $10,000, depending on whether you are a follower or a leader. Uh, jail time, 60 days, up to 60 days in jail. The airport protesters are charged with misdemeanors, a max of 90 days in jail and a $1,000 fine. The I-5 protesters have yet to be charged, but they are facing possible gross misdemeanor charges. I've been here for about seven years. I never heard anything about police or anybody get shot around here. Neighbors reacting to the evening after one police officer was shot blocks away from their homes near North Main and Western Avenue. She had heard the shots and she said, I know those were gunshots. This came after a routine attempt to pull over a speeding car. Only the suspect wouldn't stop, even driving through a one-way street the wrong way. At the time, police chose not to chase the suspect out of concern for safety of the neighbors. We drove some of the route that police took. I want to thank the Albany police um, for doing a really fantastic job. I feel like I've got to be aware of whatever is around you all the time because you never know what's going to happen. It's been a normal day at the CVS at New Jersey and M Street, but last night, a scooter rider in the store, someone running, someone wearing a mask, what appears to be a group of young people causing a scene in this cell phone video taken by a customer. There are people in juveniles that are stealing these products and they're not being held accountable. Most of them are young. They know that they're only going to serve one day in jail or not have any consequences at the end of the day. It's unclear if the people from last night were minors. We've blurred everyone's faces since no charges have been put out. It's been ongoing ever since I've gotten here. Elisa says she's dealt with crime since she moved to this neighborhood two years ago. She's speaking out and encouraging others to do the same. It just comes down to working with, you know, our lawmakers and our council members, our ANC, and having them recognize what's actually happening in this area and that it's scary for us. Still ahead in our next hour of the National Desk, impeachment dismissed. Republicans outraged after Senate Democrats went against, they say, the will of the people to exonerate Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. And breaking right now out of Indonesia, the island issuing its highest level volcano alert after this eruption you're looking at right here, this sending ash thousands of feet into the, into the air. More details ahead in 90 seconds.
And breaking now, a tsunami alert has been triggered in Indonesia after at least five large volcanic eruptions happening just over the past 24 hours at the Ruang Mountain. You're looking at one of them right now. Officials warn the mountain could collapse into the sea causing a tsunami. Officials say those eruptions sent ash thousands of feet into the air. This morning, we know hundreds have already evacuated and thousands more are being ordered to leave. Now, we will continue to watch this for any new developments and bring you those developments right here at the live desk. Now, that's our time for this hour of the National Desk. Here's a look at America's news and weather where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. There are no big storms in the forecast in the Northeast, but we're tracking a few rounds of showers. First one this morning, here we are 7 a.m. Uh, a line is running from northern New York all the way down through southern New England. This should peter out during the course of the afternoon, but notice there will be at least a chance for showers into and throughout the afternoon. Our next round is this feature right here that moves into the area on Friday. That's 2.30 in the afternoon. It should arrive in New England for Friday night and extending into very early Saturday. I'm meteorologist Jasmine Lomax with a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll start off with a few showers moving out of the area. It looks much better by the afternoon. However, another weather maker is going to lead to showers on Friday, and that's how we start the day. The rain will continue into the afternoon. High temperatures will reach the 40s through the 80s. Then overnight, we'll start to get cooler, dropping to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Good Thursday morning. I'm meteorologist Michael Larenberg with a look at your southeast regional forecast. We are looking at a mix of clouds and sunshine through parts of the southeast, but it will be mostly sunny from Virginia through south and North Carolina. Clouds, but little rain moving through parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. There will be some showers near the Mississippi River Valley at the Arkansas line and a line of storms probably heading into western sections of Tennessee and also uh, northern sections of Virginia late in the day. Highs 80s to near 90. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. We've got scattered rain and thunderstorms firing up across the central part of the Midwest today, and that'll race its way to the east. Now, behind that, it's going to be a lot cooler. Check out Bismarck, 41 for the high for the day today, 39 tomorrow. That rain shifts its way into the Ohio Valley overnight tonight into your Friday morning and racing out quickly, and that's going to leave all of us dry heading into the start of the weekend on Saturday. Definitely some cool temperatures, though, 50s and 40s all across the Midwest. Good Thursday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Hucci. I look at our forecast across the region today and we'll be on the lookout for a few strong to perhaps a severe thunderstorm stretching from San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up into a Little Rock and Shreveport, especially as we head through the evening hours. Could get a couple storms with some wind and some hail. We step into that forecast Friday and outside some patchy clouds, a little bit of a calmer day with a few showers possible. Notice those temperatures will be running a little on the cooler side Friday afternoon. Good morning. I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Those very warm temperatures from Nevada into Arizona, getting into Phoenix in the mid 90s. Now up to the Pacific Northwest, we still have very cool temperatures in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon in the 50s. That goes into Montana, where we're staying so cool with still that cool low pressure, bringing in some mountain snow showers in the afternoon. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Devastating damage. All of a sudden, just heard the wind start to pick up, house start to shake, and all of a sudden, I just felt the entire house move. Severe weather leaving a path of destruction as millions of Americans brace for more storms today. Sounding the alarm. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. Records do, in fact, exist. I know this because I've personally passed them to the FBI. Whistleblowers go on the record and testify that Boeing knew about safety issues with commercial planes. Hanging by a thread. I'm operating with the smallest margin in U.S. history. I have a one-vote margin. The only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. In an election year, having a speaker who can't do the job is really bad. The House leadership in jeopardy as Republicans fight over sending taxpayer dollars to foreign countries. And footing the bill. It's a big middle finger uh, to working class folks who either paid off their student loans or didn't take them out in the first place. How much you could end up paying for someone else's student loan debt. Live from the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It's Thursday, April 18th. More states right now bracing for severe weather with a major plunge in temperatures also set to sweep in. It also comes after days of brutal storms, including winds so strong. Those winds literally tore a home right off its foundation in Ohio. Let's get right to Angela Brown at the live desk for the latest forecasts and the damage. Wow. This is some video right here of the destruction that was left behind. Yeah, the damage really adding up for some families. A live look at the National Desk radar as we track storm threats moving into the lower Ohio Valley today. We have a closer look at those threats in just a minute. But first, we have some brand new video for you just into the live desk out of Berman, Ohio, about 40 miles southeast of Columbus. You can see it right here. The night sky lit up with a lightning show. And we also just updated these power outage numbers for you as well. More than 10,000 are in the dark across West Virginia and thousands more in Pennsylvania, Missouri, Tennessee right now. And take a look at this video out of Ohio, really showing, capturing this major damage inside of a family dollar store. You can see items just tossed all over the store, some ending up on the floor. Now to a live look over St. Louis, Missouri, as another round of severe thunderstorms threatens that region today, bringing strong wind, large hail, and possibly even tornadoes. And also, here's a look at the region that will likely see storm threats this afternoon, spanning from the lower Ohio Valley all the way south to Del Rio, and now to a live look over Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the cities that starting today will start to feel temperatures dropping by Saturday. Nearly 200 million Americans will feel below average temperatures. The most notable noticeable changes are expected in the high plains where the highest temperatures could reach 15 to 20 degrees below average. Now we're keeping our eyes on this all morning long right here at the live desk and online all the time. At the National Weather Desk, part of the National Desk.com. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country would not bow to outside pressure to hold off on a response to Iran's attack. While it's unclear how Israel will respond, U.S. officials have said they expect any military action to be limited in scope. Israeli defense leaders right now only saying their response would be decided by them at the time of their choosing. The U.S. now is expected to try to block a United Nations vote tomorrow that would give Palestine full U.N. membership, effectively recognizing a Palestinian state. If it passes a Security Council vote today, the U.S. could move to veto the resolution. And the battle in the House heating up over foreign aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene still threatening to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson if he sides with Democrats. Last night, Johnson did add a border security bill, but it will not be part of the final package. Johnson now also appears poised to lean on some Democrats to pass some of the bills. For the first time in history, the Senate has exonerated a public official who refused to resign without holding a trial or reviewing evidence. Republicans slamming Democrats for rejecting the impeachment charges against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Yesterday, Senate Democrats did vote to dismiss the articles that the House delivered. In the 237 years of our nation's history, I don't know that there has been a more shameful day in the United States Senate than today. What we just witnessed was a travesty. It was a travesty <laughs> to the United States Constitution, and it was a travesty to the American people. 
York is now set to testify before the Senate today about his budget requests. And we're now learning a foreign national charged in a double murder used President Biden's CBP-1 app to enter the U.S. News reports indicate that Haitian migrant Canel Baptiste got into the U.S. by making an appointment on the CBP-1 app last summer. New York authorities say two weeks ago he stabbed and killed his two roommates who were also Haitian. And we now know the suspect charged in the death of a Democratic staffer entered the U.S. illegally. Nevada authorities charged Honduran national Almarida Linares with hit and run charges after a crash earlier this month that killed Kurt Engelhart. Engelhart was a senior advisor to Nevada Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Rieta Linares is in jail. ICE placed a detainer on him so they can start deportation proceedings. The number of Chinese nationals illegally entering the U.S. between ports of entry is skyrocketing. Customs and Border Protection report that from October to March, agents caught 24,296 Chinese nationals. That's already more than the 24,125 caught in all of the prior fiscal year and does not include the numbers at ports of entry. And breaking this morning, law enforcement across several states are working to restore services after widespread outages overnight that black calls to police and also other emergency agencies. This morning, some services are still spotty in South Dakota. The State Department of Public Safety says if you cannot call 911, you can text them or call the non-emergency line. The city of Del Rio, now that's in Texas, also reporting issues as well, although police there say it was a problem with the phone carrier, not the city system. And all four states are reporting impacts. We already told you about South Dakota. We told you about Texas. Now let's talk about portions of Nebraska and also Nevada, including in Las Vegas, where we're taking, we're going to give you a live look. It's still in the dark there on the strip this morning. Las Vegas police reported issues there were resolved just before 9:15 last night, several hours after the outages started. So far, though, no word on what actually caused it. Again, services down in several states this morning. We are watching for any new details. If we learn them, of course, we're going to share them with you here at the live desk and online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Thank you, Angela. New developments in President Biden's classified documents case. Some lawmakers now warning of national security concerns after analyzing the classified records he had in his personal possession. Florida Congressman Mike Waltz wrote, I just reviewed a portion of Biden's classified documents that were taken from his basement by special counsel Her. They were highly classified and relevant to current national security threats. We need an immediate damage assessment from the intelligence community. More than a dozen U.S. attorneys general are accusing Bank of America of targeting customers for their religious and political beliefs. The 15 AGs signed a letter criticizing the bank for a pattern of discriminatory behavior. The letter claims conservative clients were either denied accounts, had their accounts closed, or were denied basic services like ATM use. The House approved a bill that would limit how the government can purchase your online data. It is called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act, and it now requires law enforcement or other government agencies to first get a warrant before buying information from third party companies that collect your information from apps. The president plans to forgive more student loan debt for more than 270,000 borrowers to the tune of another $7 billion. This is $7 billion in transfer debt. The National Desk's Matt Galka is here with us. And Matt, a top business school in the country, says, of course, this is going to cost taxpayers in the long run because someone's got to pay for it. How much is this going to cost us? Yeah, no such thing as a free lunch, as they say. The Wharton Business School projects canceling the $7 billion along with the other student debt plans the president has put forward will end up costing taxpayers half a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Too many Americans, especially young people, are saddled with unsustainable debts in exchange for college degree. President Joe Biden has tried to make canceling student loans a pillar of his time in office. The administration's latest announcement aims to cancel another $7.4 billion of debt, mostly through waiving high amounts of recruit interest. The Penn Wharton budget model has the new plan, along with other previous debt forgiveness plans, costing taxpayers big over the next decade. All told, taxpayers could be on the hook for $559 billion for the next 10 years. It's a big middle finger uh, to working class folks who either paid off their student loans or didn't take them out in the first place. Missouri Republican Senator Eric Schmidt sued the Biden administration over debt forgiveness in 2022 when he was his state's attorney general. 
The Supreme Court eventually stopped the president's last debt forgiveness effort. The White House says the new plan uses a different authority to get around the Supreme Court ruling. It's unconstitutional. He has no authority under statute to do it. It was struck down before. I think this is a cynical election year ploy. The $559 billion is equivalent to more than six years of the annual budget of the Department of Education. Even some Democrats admit canceling student loans doesn't get to the root cause of the high costs of education. I think the intent is good, uh, clearly, uh, to provide relief of student debt. I think it's how you go about it that I think for many is troubling and uh, needs more work. Now, if the proposal is finalized, the canceled accrued interest could go into effect as early as this fall, right around election time. But the plan will almost certainly be taken to court. Reporting live on Capitol Hill, I'm Matt Gelker for the National Desk, America's News Now. Thank you so much, Matt. Ahead on the National Desk, economy on edge, voters rallying behind former President Trump as American families continue to pay the price for the Biden administration's failed economic policies. And here at the Live Desk, we're breaking down the alarming accounts by whistleblowers revealing what they call dangerous oversights in the manufacturing process of Boeing planes, how lawmakers plan to act. Coming up in 90 seconds. And flight fears mounting this morning after two back-to-back -back Senate hearings revealing what could be disastrous issues with some of Boeing's most popular planes. Right now, lawmakers are considering new legislation to regulate Boeing, but really getting anything passed on Capitol Hill could be a long shot. Right now, Congress really isn't agreeing on much. A whistleblower testified on Wednesday raising concerns about Boeing's manufacturing protocol, claiming the company took shortcuts when it made the 777 and 787 Dreamliner jets. He said crews assembling the plane failed to properly fill tiny gaps when joining together parts of the fuselage, something he says could be disastrous. Are these planes safe? Right now, I would not, you know, it's like an earthquake. You know, it, the big earthquake is coming, but when, when that hits, the building that, you know, you, let's say if you're talking of a building, have to be prepared to uh, accommodate that type of a, let's say, shakeup. You know, it has to be built properly. Right now, from what I've seen, the airplanes are not being built per spec and per requirement. Hmm. Lawmakers are calling those accounts more than troubling, but Boeing is pushing back on those accusations, saying they are inaccurate, inaccurate for the past five years. Though the company also faced federal questioning and also scrutiny following two deadly crashes of a different Boeing model. We're talking about the 737 MAX. Adding to that pressure is what, of course, happened back in January. You're looking at the images right here when a door plug blew off mid takeoff on an Alaskan Airlines flight, making some people more fearful to fly. 
High inflation and minimum wage hikes are costing Americans big time, just as Trump and Biden hit the campaign trail with very different economic policies. Joining us now to discuss is Vice President of General Economics and Trade at the Cato Institute, Scott Lincecum. Good morning to you, Scott, and welcome back to the National Desk. Good to see you. First, let's talk about the economic outlook right now and high inflation. What are we looking at, especially with future gas prices, which will inevitably drive up inflation all around? And what do you think this is going to mean for interest rates? Well, there's no doubt that gas prices are a, a political problem. Uh, voters tend to blame or credit the president when gas prices go up or down. Um, but economists you know, tend to actually look away from gas prices um, because they're so volatile and because they're disconnected from overall inflation be driven by big global issues. Um, still, you know, there's no doubt that inflation is still a problem for President Biden. Uh, price increases have slowed, um, but prices themselves are still way up since 2020, particularly for things that everybody needs like groceries um, and other necessities. Um, and the other big problem is that prices aren't cooling as much as the Federal Reserve and the president hoped. The Fed wants uh, 2 percent inflation, but we're still way over 3 percent inflation. So that means for you and me and for the economy, interest rates are going to remain higher for longer. Um, economists were expecting rate cuts this year. We might just get one or maybe two. Um, but that in turn is bad news for anybody with an adjustable rate loan or looking oh, yeah. to make a big purchase like a car or house. Unfortunately, uh, those loan rates are going to be a lot higher than I think a lot of folks were expecting. And in an election year, we know Americans tend to vote with their pocketbook, with their wallet. So how will the administration, how will President Biden escape this on the campaign trail? Yeah, everybody hates inflation. Uh, we thought we learned that in the 70s. We're relearning it today. Um, and the president knows he has a political problem. Um, so uh, he's reportedly, though, turned to a classic political move of saying, sure, uh, I'm bad on inflation, but my opponent, President Trump, is even worse. Um, in particular, the president's reportedly targeting President Trump's proposals to impose a lot of tariffs on almost everything we import and even higher tariffs on stuff from China. Um, and in one sense, uh, Biden is right. Um, Trump's tariff proposals would raise consumer prices by a lot, uh, maybe as much as $1,500 per year. But there's one big problem for the president, and that is that he has kept a lot of Trump's previous tariffs in place. He's defended them in court. Those are also raising prices. And the president could lower prices immediately by eliminating these tariffs, but he hadn't done that. He's kept those around. So uh, it's a, a tricky political move and one that I doubt is going to work. I want to go to California right now because, as we know, the state just raised its minimum wage for fast food workers in the state, 25 percent, in fact, to 20 bucks an hour. But now some of those workers are being replaced by technology, which is what a lot of economists thought was going to happen. So tell us more and, and how this could really transform the food and restaurant industry, especially in California. Sure. You know, economists always ask to look beyond the direct effect of a policy and look to those indirect effects or secondary effects. And minimum wages um, are really some of the best examples of why. Um, there's no doubt that a minimum, when you raise the minimum wage, some workers are going to get higher take home pay. But employers don't just sit around and let that happen because they still need to make the numbers work. They still need to keep their businesses running and remain profitable. So they adjust. Um, sometimes they adjust work hours or schedules. Sometimes they stop hiring new workers. Sometimes they raise prices. Um, and they often replace workers with technology. Uh, in California, we're seeing a lot of that last one, along with some higher prices, too. So uh, you're seeing fast food kiosks where you order uh, from a, a tablet instead of a human. You're seeing maids, robot maids in the bathrooms. Uh, in New York, they're even trying to zoom in workers from the Philippines through other yeah, black screens. Right. Um, now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing for uh, workers that can find other jobs or consumers that embrace the technology, but it's also definitely not when a minimum wage advocates intended um, when they passed these laws. All right, Scott Lincecum, always great to see you, and uh, happy Friday Eve. Have a great weekend. We appreciate you joining Thanks. us. <laughs> Thank you. Amazon ditching its cashier-less checkout system at its grocery stores and maybe trying to sell the same checkout technology to a store near you. The National Desk, Janae Bowen's joining us right now with more on the move. So it worked out so well for them. They're trying to get rid of it and get other stores to buy it, huh?
<laughs> right, Jan. It seems like it's a situation of one man's trash is another man's treasure. Amazon says they are removing just walkout technology in their Amazon Fresh grocery stores because customers rather have a store clerk in big grocery stores. Now, company leaders think the technology is better suited for smaller stores because oftentimes customers want to get in and get out of those shops quickly. According to the Associated Press, Amazon wants to sell the technology to more than 120 third party businesses by the end of the year. Now, this could be an uphill battle, seeing as they are trying to sell the very thing they are removing from their stores. Here's a little bit more about how the technology actually works. Once payment, whatever the method, has been authorized, a virtual cart is created and the gates will open. Let's walk inside. Once in the store, the cameras above, coupled with shelf sensors, will detect items removed from shelves by a consumer and will add that item to their virtual cart. Now the company says no facial recognition is used and once the customer is done shopping, they will exit through the gate and will be automatically charged. Now there have been a lot of social media posts claiming that the system was powered by people in India who manually added up items in carts as customers shopped. Now Amazon confirms using human reviewers for the technology but says customers are not being watched live by people in India. But according to the AP, Amazon is declining to share how many people review and label videos when there's a glitch in the system. Jan. And breaking right now, a live look at Las Vegas this morning where a driver slammed into a group of people at a bus stop, killing two people, including a child. What we are learning from police this morning, coming up in 90 seconds. And a live look this morning over Las Vegas, right behind me here after a deadly overnight crash when a wrong way driver plowed into a bus stop that killed two people, including a child. Three others are now recovering this morning. Now, here's what the scene looked like last night um, after the crash. You can see it right here, police lights in the distance, a lot of police officers on the scene. Lots of traffic here backed up. Police believe the driver could have been under the influence or even speeding at the time of the crash. Keep in mind, this all happened just around 7.30 p.m., minutes after reports started really coming in of those 911 service outages that we told you about earlier this hour that spanned across the Las Vegas Valley and also several other states. Now, we are working with our reporters who are on the ground in Las Vegas this morning, KSNV, to bring you any new details this morning right here at the live desk and online all the time at the nationaldesk.com. Thank you, Angela. A high school student now charged after attacking a teacher was caught on camera. Video going viral. It happened at Park Land High School in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Police arrested the student on Tuesday and charged him with three misdemeanors. Diversity and equity staff jobs in North Carolina's public university system could be on the chopping block. After the Committee on University Governance voted to reverse and replace existing DEI policy, they decided to do this. Another vote set for next month, and if approved, the repeal would take effect immediately. 
Florida public schools are now requiring that students are taught the dangers of communism. Governor Ron DeSantis just signed the measure into law. He said it will require teachers to explain the tactics used by American communist movements as well as negative events that took place under communist regimes. It does take effect in the school year starting in 2026. Ahead in our next half hour, red threat, lobbyists on behalf of China lining lawmakers' pockets as Washington considers a ban of CCP-controlled TikTok. Also priced out, the American dream of owning a home slipping out of reach for many as high costs and interest rates keep buyers at bay. First, here's a look at America's news and weather now, where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. There are no big storms in the forecast in the Northeast, but we're tracking a few rounds of showers. First one this morning, here we are 7 a.m. Uh, a line is running from northern New York all the way down through southern New England. This should peter out during the course of the afternoon, but notice there will be at least a chance for showers into and throughout the afternoon. Our next round is this feature right here that moves into the area on Friday. That's 2.30 in the afternoon. It should arrive in New England for Friday night and extending into very early Saturday. I'm meteorologist Jasmine Lomax with a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll start off with a few showers moving out of the area. It looks much better by the afternoon. However, another weather maker is going to lead to showers on Friday, and that's how we start the day. The rain will continue into the afternoon. High temperatures will reach the 40s through the 80s. Then overnight, we'll start to get cooler, dropping to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Good Thursday morning. I'm meteorologist Michael Larenberg with a look at your southeast regional forecast. We are looking at a mix of clouds and sunshine through parts of the southeast, but it will be mostly sunny from Virginia through south and North Carolina. Clouds, but little rain moving through parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. There will be some showers near the Mississippi River Valley at the Arkansas line and a line of storms probably heading into western sections of Tennessee and also on northern sections of Virginia late in the day. Highs 80s to near 90. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. We've got scattered rain and thunderstorms firing up across the central part of the Midwest today, and that'll race its way to the east. Now, behind that, it's going to be a lot cooler. Check out Bismarck, 41 for the high for the day today, 39 tomorrow. That rain shifts its way into the Ohio Valley overnight tonight into your Friday morning and racing out quickly, and that's going to leave all of us dry heading into the start of the weekend on Saturday. Definitely some cool temperatures, though, 50s and 40s all across the Midwest. Good Thursday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Succi. I look at our forecast across the region today and we'll be on the lookout for a few strong to perhaps a severe thunderstorm stretching from San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up into a uh, Little Rock and Shreveport, especially as we head through the evening hours. Could get a couple storms of some wind and some hail. We step in that our forecast Friday and outside some patchy clouds, a little bit of a calmer day with a few showers possible. Notice those temperatures will be running a little on the cooler side Friday afternoon. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Those very warm temperatures from Nevada into Arizona, getting into Phoenix in the mid 90s. Now up to the Pacific Northwest, we still have very cool temperatures in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon in the 50s. That goes into Montana where we're staying so cool with still that cool low pressure, bringing in some mountain snow showers in the afternoon. That's the scene from here.
The National Desk, America's News Now. Now on the National Desk, America's News Now priced out. The American dream of buying and owning a home getting crushed by red hot inflation as new data shows renters are feeling stuck. Plus, there's no other way to describe it. It's surrender. It's disappointing. I'm oh, very disappointed. The only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. Funding fight, a vote set on where more than 95 billion taxpayer dollars could go, putting the House Speaker's position at risk. And the path of destruction, communities in America's heartland that are already reporting major damage, preparing for yet another round of severe weather. And thanks for joining us. You are watching the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It's Thursday, April 18th, and weather alerts do remain in place for some of the hardest hit areas. Angela Brown at the live desk tracking the very latest for us this morning, including huge drop in temperatures for some 200 million Americans. Good morning to you. Yes, we're talking 15, 20 degrees in some cases. A live look at the National Desk radar this morning as the lower Ohio Valley braces for another round of storms after severe thunderstorms swept the region on Wednesday. A look ahead to today's threats. We're going to have that for you in just a minute. But first, we have some brand new video just into the live desk. You see it right here on Bourbon, Ohio, about 40 miles southeast of Columbus, where the night sky all lit up here with the lightning show. We just updated these numbers for you as well. We're talking power outages, thousands in the dark across. You see it here, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Missouri, also Michigan at this point. And take a look at this video right out of Ohio of major damage inside of a family dollar store. You can see products just tossed all over the floor. The store in some cases in disarray. Now to a live look over St. Louis, Missouri, as another round of severe thunderstorms threatens that region today, bringing strong wind, large hail, and maybe even some tornadoes their way as well. And here's a look at the region that will likely see those storm threats this afternoon, spanning from the lower Ohio Valley all the way south to Del Rio. And now to a live look over at Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the cities that starting today apparently will start to feel that temperature drop that Jan talked about. By Saturday, nearly 200 million Americans will feel below average temperatures. The most noticeable changes are expected in the high plains, where the highest temperatures could reach 15 to 20 degrees below average. We're keeping our eyes on this all morning long right here at the live desk and online all the time at the National Weather Desk, part of the nationaldesk.com. Thank you so much, Angela. New developments in Israel's plans to respond to Iran's barrage of missile strikes. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country will make its own decision when and where to strike. Also, Israel's finance minister said the response should be fierce and severe to deter future attacks. U.S. officials have said, though, that they expect any response, if it does involve military action, would be limited in scope. Meantime, this morning in Washington House, lawmakers sorting through a long list of proposed bills that do have the support of President Biden. House Speaker Mike Johnson officially setting up a Saturday night vote on foreign aid funding despite some backlash from his own party. I don't have all my Republicans who agree on that rule, and that means the only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. Altogether, the bills do cost $95.3 billion and address aid for Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine. A key difference from the Senate's package is that $9.5 billion in economic aid to Ukraine would be structured as a loan, but the repayment terms will be set by the president. 80% of the money that would be allocated in this legislation is for replenishment of our own weapons and stocks. I mean, this is uh, something that makes sense. We're, we're, what we're doing is funding America's industrial defense base. These are jobs in America building weapons. My concern about this package is it's $95 billion of foreign aid when A, we're $34.5 trillion in debt, but B, we're also dealing with wide open borders. And, and central to our entire debate over the last year, as you know, has been the importance of making sure we secure the borders of the United States. In an attempt to get more Republicans on board, Speaker Johnson is also introducing a renewed border security bill that could be voted on this Saturday. It is the same as the House's HR2 package that passed last year, but replaces funding for an e-verify requirement for employers with funding for border states to build walls and reimburse law enforcement agencies for border enforcement expenses. Both chambers are scheduled to be in recess next week. Not clear, though, if the Senate will stay in Washington if the bills are passed in the House. TikTok could face a day of reckoning in Washington very soon. Congress fast-tracking a bill that would force the app 
to be sold or face a ban in the U.S. National Desk's Matt Galka is here with more on this for us. And, and Matt, it looks like China getting heavily involved here. Yeah, and let's talk about that bill first. TikTok is owned by Beijing-based ByteDance, and because of privacy and data concerns, the House passed a bill last month that says TikTok must be sold to an American company or get banned here in the U.S. That bill, now tied to that foreign aid package you were just talking about that's set to be voted on this weekend, meaning if it's wrapped up with other priorities, it has a better chance of getting signed into law. Politico reports the Chinese embassy has gotten involved, meeting with staffers on the Hill and downplaying national security concerns. TikTok has about 170 million users in America, and the bill has gotten significant backlash from young people and business owners who use the app for entertainment and to make money. So certainly something to keep an eye on in that vote this weekend. Reporting live on Capitol Hill, I'm Matt Galka for the National Desk. America's News Now. All right, Matt, thanks so much. In a reversal, President Biden now taking a page out of former President Trump's playbook to get tougher on China. Yesterday, he called on his administration to consider tripling tariffs on Chinese steel while visiting the United Steel Workers headquarters in Pittsburgh. The Trump campaign blasted Biden's request, calling it too little, too late. The people of Poland love him. They really do. They really love you. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish, but he's done a fantastic job, and he's my friend. And we had uh, four great years together, four great years. So let's do it. We may have to do it again. Former President Trump meeting with more conservative foreign leaders on the campaign trail. Last night, he did speak with Polish President Andrzej Duda to discuss ongoing wars and a proposal for NATO countries to spend 3% of their GDP on defense. New polling out this morning does have Trump leading Biden in five out of six battleground states. According to Echelon, Trump is up 51 to 45 in Arizona. In Georgia, he's up 52 to 42. Michigan, 51 to 45. Nevada, they have him with a 51 to 44 differential there, and in Pennsylvania, 49 to 45. Some Americans, man, they want to move, but they can't because existing mortgage rates are too uh, low right now to give up. So homeowners are being paralyzed by current rates, and it's creating this lock-in effect for the housing market across the country. Higher rates are responsible for about 1.3 million fewer home sales this spring compared to last spring. Nearly 40% of renters think they will never own a home as a result of this. And the National Desk, Janae Bowens joins us now with the numbers. You can see why, Janae. There's a ton of factors here. You got inflation, high interest rates. There's also a housing shortage. So a lot of renters, they, they think they're stuck. Exactly, Jan. It's a lot going on. And higher prices are the key reason why so many renters have lost hope in home ownership. We met Ashley Nicole a few days ago. She was forced to move out of her Dallas apartment because of high prices. We were up to about $2,000. Um, and that's before utilities or anything. She's not the only one with frustrations about her housing situation. Nearly 40% of renters think they'll never own a home. That number is up 27% compared to less than a year ago. That's according to a new survey from Redfin. When we came down here to Texas, we intended to buy a house, but we kept getting outbid. Um, you know, it's just, it's crazy. Lack of affordability is the top reason many renters don't believe they'll buy a home in the near future. Ability to save for a down payment, afford mortgage payments, and high mortgage rates are also roadblocks. We have a low inventory environment, which is bringing prices up even higher, and mortgage rates aren't really easing the way that we're hoping they are. Um, and in the meantime, buyers are competing against historically high levels of cash buyers. Currently, mortgage rates are above 7%. The median home sale price is more than $378,000. And earlier this month, the median monthly housing payment hit an all-time high of $2,747. I'm almost 32. Um, I thought I would be able to, to buy a house by now. And another survey found more than a third of Gen Zers and millennials who plan to buy a home expect to receive a cash gift from family to help fund their down payment. Of course, Jan, this just shows how expensive homeownership has gotten. All right, Janae, thanks so much. Straight ahead, a prolific serial killer and his defense attorney. As we approach the 30th anniversary of the execution of John Wayne Gacy, his former attorney joins us next as she discusses more details that were untold in her new book. And breaking here, we just got our hands on the new jobs report from the Labor Department. We'll share them with you coming up after a very quick break.
And breaking right here at the live desk, just in the last 15 minutes, we just got our hands on the new jobs report from the U.S. Labor Department. And here it is right here coming at coming in at 212,000 right here, a thousand more than the previous level. The Labor Department still looking like a bright spot for the U.S. economy. As many Americans are still struggling, though, to pay for high prices on everything from gas to groceries. In March, the U.S. recorded a blockbuster jobs growth, adding more than 303,000 jobs. On Tuesday, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell pumped the brakes on any expectations of rate cuts, citing a lack of progress so far this year. Economists from major banks are now changing their initial forecast. Bank of America economists, for example, now say they predict just one rate cut this year in December. Now that's down from the four they initially called for. Bank of America securities economist Michael Gapin giving us his insights saying quote right here 2024 is starting to look like 20, 2015 but in reverse. Then the Fed signaled hikes uh, it cannot deliver. Now the Fed may be signaling cuts that inflation data do not justify. This May marks the 30th anniversary of the execution of serial killer John Wayne Gacy, known as the Killer Clown, one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history, murdering at least 33 teenage boys and young men in his Chicago area home and then burying them under his house. Well, now his former attorney Karen Conti reveals some untold truths in her new book, Killing Time with John Wayne Gacy, Defending America's Most Evil Serial Killer on Death Row. Karen, good morning to you. Welcome back to the National Desk. Uh, I'm just curious, how did you get to represent John Wayne Gacy? Tell us the timeline here. What happened? Well, the crimes were committed when I was in high school. So flash ahead 14 years, uh, Gacy has been sentenced to death. I'm now a lawyer for just a few years. And we get the call, my partner and I, that Gacy wanted a First Amendment lawyer because he had some civil matters that he had been sued on. Well, we had no intention of representing him in those kinds of things. But I was curious, Jan, I was very curious. When you grow up in Chicago, John Wayne Gacy's the boogeyman. He's a household word. And I wanted to go down to death row, a place I had never been. And I wanted to look at the epitome of evil. And we did. And after meeting him and after being on death row, we decided to take on his death penalty appeals at the very end. And I think so many people are shocked when the serial killer is the neighbor next door or the nice man you never expected would do this. What was he like? And when you were in his presence, did you, did you feel the evilness? Did you, did you see it? I would like to say that I did, but I didn't. He was your normal guy. He was like the bus driver you say hello to every morning. He was affable. He was glib. He was engaging. He was intelligent. And that's how he got away with it. I mean, here was a guy who lived a very moral life most of the time. He went to church. He raised family. He was good to his kids. You know, he volunteered in churches and in hospitals. He mowed the lawn for his neighbors. And then he would go out and do the most unspeakable things you can imagine. So he was very compartmental and he was very good at being normal uh, when you were dealing with him on a daily basis. That's, that's fascinating. And I think it's because, too, so many people are into true crime these days. I mean, that's like the number one podcast, true crime. You see it on, you know, Netflix, Amazon. Everybody loves true crime. Why are we seeing so many more documentaries now about the mind of the serial killer? And how do they get to this place? Are there certain traits and childhood attributes that can be a, a big red flag? Because there are many people who might have experienced something similar to what Gacy did and possibly even worse, but did not become serial killers. So what was it, do you think that got him to this place or that can get someone to this place? That's a really good question, and it's hard to say because, as you said, like, he was abused by his father. There's no question he was physically and mentally and verbally abused. But a lot of people are, and they don't turn out to be murderers. Uh, but he also was sexually abused. He had trouble with his sexual identity from a very young age. His father was relentless when it came to berating him about that. And he was also he had, uh, sustained two very serious head injuries, which the experts say can damage a part of your brain that deals with empathy or impulse control. So add all these things together and, and you come up with a Gacy, but again, you have a lot of people in this world who have less, you know, more traumatic things happen to them and they don't end up killing 33 yeah. boys. Yeah, and you have said what concerned you most was that he was not arrested sooner. Why wasn't he? And if investigators asked you where they should look for additional victims, where would you point them to? 
Well, Gacy was out of town a lot during his killing spree. He was doing construction jobs, and I saw his business records, so that confirmed it. There's no question in my mind that when he was in rural Wisconsin or Pacific Northwest or Florida, that he was continuing his crime spree in those areas. And because we don't have a database from that time that was integrated so that if he crossed a state line, nobody would have known that there were boys missing and tied them to Gacy. But if someone were to go back and look at those records and determine were there men and boys who went missing in those areas, perhaps we could tie more victims to Gacy. But again, so many years have gone by that I'm not sure that'll ever happen. Right. And very quickly, do you think there are more serial killers now or is it because we're just seeing more attention perhaps on true crime? There are not. There are actually drastically fewer serial killers and fewer victims. I think we're just obsessed with it. We always have been with the Jack the Rippers uh, of the world. We will always be obsessed with serial killers. And I think that it's really just because it, it's a news story and because people are just yeah. completely fascinated by the worst of the worst. Yeah, they really are. Karen Conti, always great to talk to you. Uh, Thank you, Best of luck to you and, and your book as well. We appreciate you Thank joining you. us this morning. And still ahead, barring blockades, Washington state lawmakers pushing to increase penalties for disruptive and illegal protests. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From a New York community remembering the life of a fallen officer to chaos at a CVS pharmacy caught on camera in the nation's capital, we are taking the pulse of America. But we start in Washington State, where there is a new push to crack down on disruptive protests. Right in the middle of peak travel time, pro-Palestinian protesters use their bodies and cars to block the expressway to SeaTac Airport. So intense, some frantic travelers walk to the terminal instead. We do not support you interrupting the lives and safety of your fellow citizens. Republican Representative Spencer Hutchins has renewed his call for a new law, one that would make intentionally obstructing a freeway a felony. He and other lawmakers tried to get it passed after a similar protest on I-5 in Seattle in January. That legislation got no traction. What kind of penalties are we talking about? We're talking about fines of anywhere from $1,000 to $6,000 or $10,000, depending on whether you are a follower or a leader. Uh, jail time, 60 days, up to 60 days in jail. The airport protesters are charged with misdemeanors, a max of 90 days in jail and a $1,000 fine. The I-5 protesters have yet to be charged, but they are facing possible gross misdemeanor charges. I've been here for about seven years. I never heard anything about police or anybody get shot around here. Neighbors reacting to the evening after one police officer was shot blocks away from their homes near North Main and Western Avenue. 
she had heard the shots and she said, I know those were gunshots. This came after a routine attempt to pull over a speeding car. Only the suspect wouldn't stop, even driving through a one-way street the wrong way. At the time, police chose not to chase the suspect out of concern for safety of the neighbors. We drove some of the route that police took. I want to thank the Albany police um, for doing a really fantastic job. I feel like I've got to be aware of whatever is around you all the time because you never know what's going to happen. It's been a normal day at the CVS at New Jersey and M Street, but last night, a scooter rider in the store, someone running, someone wearing a mask, what appears to be a group of young people causing a scene in this cell phone video taken by a customer. There are people in juveniles that are stealing these products and they're not being held accountable. Most of them are young. They know that they're only going to serve one day in jail or not have any consequences at the end of the day. It's unclear if the people from last night were minors. We've blurred everyone's faces since no charges have been put out. It's been ongoing ever since I've got here. Elisa says she's dealt with crime since she moved to this neighborhood two years ago. She's speaking out and encouraging others to do the same. It just comes down to working with, you know, our lawmakers and our council members, our ANC, and having them recognize what's actually happening in this area and that it's scary for us. And breaking out of Indonesia, the nation issuing its highest level volcano alert after several eruptions that sent ash thousands of feet into the air. More details ahead in 90 seconds. And breaking now, a tsunami alert has been triggered in Indonesia after at least five large volcanic eruptions happened just over the past really 24 hours of Ruang Mountain. You're looking at one of them right now in this video. Officials warn the mountain could collapse into the sea, causing a tsunami. Officials say those eruptions sent ash thousands of feet into the air. This morning, we know hundreds have already been evacuated in the region and thousands more are still being ordered to leave. Now, we are watching this carefully, monitoring for any details as they come in, we'll bring them to you right here at the live desk. Now, that's our time for this hour of the National Desk. Now, here's a look at America's news and weather where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look at the Northeast. There are no big storms in the forecast in the Northeast, but we're tracking a few rounds of showers. First one this morning. Here we are 7 a.m. Uh, a line is running from northern New York all the way down through southern New England. This should peter out during the course of the afternoon, but notice there will be at least a chance for showers into and throughout the afternoon. Our next round is this feature right here that moves into the area on Friday. That's 2.30 in the afternoon. It should arrive in New England for Friday night and extending into very early Saturday. 
I'm meteorologist Jasmine Lomax with a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. We'll start off with a few showers moving out of the area. It looks much better by the afternoon. However, another weather maker is going to lead to showers on Friday, and that's how we start the day. The rain will continue into the afternoon. High temperatures will reach the 40s through the 80s. Then overnight, we'll start to get cooler, dropping to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Good Thursday morning. I'm meteorologist Michael Larenberg with a look at your southeast regional forecast. We are looking at a mix of clouds and sunshine through parts of the southeast, but it will be mostly sunny from Virginia through south and North Carolina. Clouds, but little rain moving through parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. There will be some showers near the Mississippi River Valley at the Arkansas line and a line of storms probably heading into western sections of Tennessee and also uh, northern sections of Virginia late in the day. Highs 80s to near 90. Good Thursday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael. We've got scattered rain and thunderstorms firing up across the central part of the Midwest today, and that'll race its way to the east. Now, behind that, it's going to be a lot cooler. Check out Bismarck, 41 for the high for the day today, 39 tomorrow. That rain shifts its way into the Ohio Valley overnight tonight into your Friday morning and racing out quickly, and that's going to leave all of us dry heading into the start of the weekend on Saturday. Definitely some cool temperatures, though, 50s and 40s all across the Midwest. Good Thursday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Hucci and look at our forecast across the region today and we'll be on the lookout for a few strong to perhaps a severe thunderstorm stretching from San Antonio, Austin, Dallas up into a uh, Little Rock and Shreveport, especially as we head through the evening hours. Could get a couple storms of some wind and some hail. We step in that our forecast Friday and outside some patchy clouds, a little bit of a calmer day with a few showers possible. And those temperatures will be running a little on the cooler side Friday afternoon. Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Those very warm temperatures from Nevada into Arizona, getting into Phoenix in the mid 90s. Now up to the Pacific Northwest, we still have very cool temperatures in the eastern part of Washington and Oregon in the 50s. That goes into Montana where we're staying so cool with still that cool low pressure, bringing in some mountain snow showers in the afternoon. That's the scene from here.